All right. Good morning, everyone. We will begin uh, shortly. Before we do so, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson to establish a quorum. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will uh, begin with the roll call for attendance, beginning with Madam Chair Moore. Present. Madam Chair Moore is present. Vice Chair Brown. Vice Chair Brown is absent. Member Bradford. Member Bradford is absent. Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder. Present. Member Holder is present. Member Jones Sawyer. Present. Member Jones Sawyer is present. Member Lewis. Present. Member Lewis is present. Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. Member Tamaki. Here. Member Tamaki is present. I'll call again um, Member Bradford. Member Brown, Madam Chair, there are nine members on the task force and the number required for a quorum is five. The number present is seven. Madam Chair, a quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Welcome, members of the public, to the California Reparations Task Force 14th official public hearing. This is our second time in Sacramento. Um, I know Dr. Brown is formerly absent, but is he available via video if he wanted to make some audio remarks? I mean, is he available via... <laughs> Great. So, Dr. Brown, we're able to uh, see you. Um, you can begin um, giving some opening remarks when you're ready. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair, for, and the members of the task force and members in the general audience. I am very appreciative that you're able to accommodate me to make remarks. And I regret very much that I'm not able to be there because I'm in Ghana, West Africa. As we speak, I was part of the delegation of our Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, that was invited to share with her this historic moment in which she, the first female and person of Asian and African descent has been blessed with a state dinner. I want to secondly say that I feel very pleased with the very thorough, scholarly, relevant, and substantive work that our task force has done regarding reparations. And they could not, as members of the task force, be a dream team working together, as we well know, without having the very able staff of our Attorney General's office. Finally, I want to say for the benefit of those in the audience and wherever persons may be. We must set the record straight regarding the contextual situation in San Francisco in which there were comments that were made attributable to me regarding cash payments. That statement was taken out of contract, context, excuse me, and definitely does not represent my thinking, my spirit, and my soul as a civil rights activist over 68 years since I was at the age of 14. We must make it very clear that the San Francisco NHCP feels that there should be some form of cash payment and installment to each person who according to the state did standard for eligibility. But we know that there are some facts 
the public should know about. Number one, the member of the task force will remain nameless at this point, who represented to the press that $5 million would be given to African-Americans in San Francisco, spoke prematurely. Also, he gave the press the opportunity to have a field day and to really sabotage our efforts with media hype. The headline from the media has been, San Francisco reparations plans to pay black Americans of San Francisco $5 million each. My friends, this is a smear campaign and an intentional fallacy designed to keep us off focus from the practical main thing. And what was that? What is it now? And what it should be in the future is reparations for African Americans. At best, you should know also that the Board of Supervisors that supposedly, according to press statements, voted unanimously for reparations, it's not true. All they did was gave lip service to reparations and then added in the conjunction, but, but, what was the first but? Aaron Paskin, the chair of the board, said no cash. Miss Connie Chan, chairperson of the finance committee, said I support reparations, but the city is facing a deficit. This indicates that that was a cotton candy, what I call stance in support of reparations. And I trust and hope that as we move forward as a state, a state reparations task force, we will not ever be victims of this kind of media hype and misrepresentation of the stewardship of both of these task force. Our position, I sum it up and finally, again, is with all the hell, the horror, and the harm that we've gone through, if it were a matter based on a sensible, factual plan for reparations, it would even possibly be more than individual $5 million cash given out. And there were itemized programs, such as the one that we have statewide in areas of education, in health, in housing, et cetera, which we all agree on. So let us not let anyone take us off of the main thing and divert our attention away from saying to America, to the state and to the nation, you owe us, but we don't want you to misrepresent us. And we do not want you to, as a nation, just give lip service to reparations, but be engaged and stop making excuses for not giving reparations to African-Americans. So thank you, there's more that I'll be saying later on in regard in this matter. But again, I say we must, as a family, stay focused and stay on point and make sure we deal with the main thing when we come to the end of our task, all agreeing that we did a great job. Where I came from in Mississippi, there's an old saying, if a task is once begun, never leave it till it's done. Be the labor, great or small, do it well or not at all. So let's hang together, do it well, and make sure that we as a state 
come up with a finished product that even the devil cannot debate against. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And thank you very much for members of the task force for affording me this opportunity. Absolutely, thank you so much, Vice Chair Brown. <laughs> Excellent as always, thank you. Uh, so now we'll turn to um, public comment and we'll start with the phone lines first. So I'll turn to uh, Ms. Martin Walton for assistance. Thank you so much. Sure, good morning. Good morning, Chair Moore, task force members and members of the public. My name is Aisha Martin Walton. I am with the Department of Justice and the task force would like to hear your comments today. Today we have two hours for public comment. One hour will be devoted to members of the public on the phone lines and one hour for members um, in, of the public who have joined us in person. If you expressed interest in participating in public comment when you checked in this morning, you received a number card. We will hear from as many of you as possible during this one hour period. We will call numbers in groups of five, so stay comfortably seated until you hear your number range called. Please remember that each speaker will have approximately two minutes for your public comment. Once you have completed your comments, please leave your numbers on the podium. Please be advised uh, that in fairness to everyone, at the two minute mark, you may be politely interrupted. However, please know that the public comment period exists during each meeting and the task force encourages everyone to participate. You may also submit written comments at any time via the email at reparationstaskforce at doj.ca.gov. So with that, let's uh, begin with our, in, our online callers. So Kaylee from AT&T, um, can you give us the first, uh, open the first phone line. Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to make a comment, please press one and then zero on your touchtone phone. You may remove yourself from queue at any time by repeating the one zero command. If you're on a speakerphone, pick up your handset before pressing the numbers. And today's session will be anonymous. You'll be given a line number. When your line number is called, your line is open. Once again, it's one and then zero at this time. One moment, please. And our first comment will go from line number nine. Please go ahead, line nine. Yes, this is Prince Ramsey. I wanna address two things, first Amos and then what we need. Um, Reverend Amos, the Bible says those you can't trust little, you cannot trust with much. You should know how many are eligible descendants of persons emancipated and that it is doable. And you should either support the $5 million minimum or resign from both task forces in disgrace. Dr. King said, we are coming for our check and you turned your back on him as his protege. Would Dr. King say no to a $5 million check for his people? Would Moses ask Pharaoh not to let his people go? So here's what we actually need. The five parts that are defined by the UN in reparation, restitution, compensation, rehabilitation, satisfaction, and discontinuation. Under restitution, we need our return of our identity as American freedmen and return of property such as Allentown, um, six up that Bruce's Beach deal, and even what happened to J.G. Burgess. And Under compensation, we should get at least $5 million a minimum. We can also do prorated lifetime payments using the average CDC life expectancy of 75 years. Um, our eligibility requirements should be based on being a person who is a descendant of someone emancipated in the United States, and we should use the five categories of genocide and checking at least one of those boxes as well. And then um, it could be funded not by tax revenue, but by bonds. And the UN says that if local and state do reparation before the national, they will be reimbursed by the national. Um, under rehabilitation, we should get the Freedmen's Bureau, the Freedmen's Bank, Freedmen's Schools, Freedmen's Hospitals, and Freedmen's Courts. Under satisfaction, we should get Freedmen Reconstruction. And under discontinuation or um, non -guarantees of, re or guarantees of non repetition, we should get genocide prevention using the five definitions of genocide. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much for your Thank comments you. today. I'm so sorry to have to interrupt you, but we really appreciate it. 
Uh, Kaylee, next, next caller, please. That will come from line 12. Please go ahead. Good morning. Line 12, your line is open. Okay. Uh, good morning, Reparations Task Force members. My name is Christina Griffin-Jones. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm with the California Black Power Network. I'm calling to express my support and encourage the task force to review and add our memo's recommendations to your report. I'm wanting to lift up that in the memo, you'll find solutions to some challenges that um, have come up <clears throat> in what the, what the task force is proposing. Uh, for instance, many of the task force's recommendations uh, cannot be separated by lineage because of the way in which uh, places where Black folks live, um, it can't be separated. Uh, for instance, all Black people present in California and who are also, are also impacted and harmed by health inequities, limited access to psychological care, and the shortcomings of our social services system, um, we often live, right, in these same impacted neighborhoods. And that care, that help, that support, reparations, it should not be excluded parts of the community, um, especially Black folks, because it includes Black immigrants or because Black immigrants make up the majority of an area or neighborhood. Um, you'll be able to find more of these uh, ways in which our recommendations uh, as the California Black Power Network help to um, address uh, the challenges um, that have uh, come up with some of the task force's recommendations. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your comments. Keely, next caller. We'll go next to line 28. Hello there. This is Tiara Ryder, and I'm a grassroots advocate with the Freedmen's Bureau.org, and I'm calling today to support reparations, which includes direct cash payments at the local, state, and federal levels for the group generally known as African or Black American freedmen, descendants of U.S. chattel slavery, the U.S. emancipation, and or freed Black persons in the U.S. prior to the 19th century. For direct cash repair, we do encourage the task force to create a clear breakdown of what each level of government owes so that it can be used as a framework across the U.S. Both local and state government are upholding white supremacist systemic violence today but is negatively impacting Black American residents, especially in the areas of land use and housing. We've heard rumors about cities like Santa Monica that are being accused of using affordable rental housing that American taxpayers paid for. We heard that they're using that only for white Eastern European immigrants. We are witnessing gentrification and displacement in real time for our Black American population. We do need to intercept the violence as soon as possible. To be clear again, there's no question on whether or not reparations are owed to descendants, they are owed and we'd like to make a request that the task force send a demand letter to the United Nations to request resolution, bring forward charges against the United States government on behalf of American freedmen for crimes against humanity. We are also asking the task force to support American freedmen in creating a secure trust fund account in order to collectively and voluntarily withhold our state and federal taxes or at least a portion of until full repair is made. We also want a portion of the cannabis sales tax to go into that trust account. If our people are continually denied equitable access to the dollar, we will be forced to create a new means of exchange. We are also requesting support from the task force this year to continue with Special Field Order 15 via the Freedmen's Bureau, which began distributing land back to Black Americans after the Civil War. I want to thank the task force for your time. I'm excited to hear your recommendations on direct tangibles for American freedmen, our American heroes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keely, next line, please. We'll go to line number 13. Yes, this is Mark, <clears throat> Mark Avis Bashar Johnson, Dash Gray, owner of Kepler Rock Books, Instagram, Kepler Rock the Movement, Fly America, Aboriginal Civil Society grant proposal on the final report on the UN Agenda 21, item 33 for 600 billion in closing. I want to address the biasness in the healthcare industry when it comes to the laws of polygamy, in particular, 
biases and UC Berkeley by Professor Dudley McGovern, who are the non-citizen nationals dealing with the economics of dowry and bride price. There is no biasness in the LGBT except for these transsexual, transnational slave trade baby killers. It was a don't ask, don't tell policy in the military defense of marriage act repealed by Obama. When we have done this, every black nation has been successful globally. Also, we need naturopathic provider options in the healthcare system dealing with holistic integrative medicine in the healthcare system for all diseases. You can't stop the summer of the Kelperati movement. And since we at the Environmental Protection Agency, we're going to deal with general theory of relativity and brown emotion. Climate change and global warming is good for black people. Photosynthesis, global cooling and ice age is not. It was destroyed by the grays. UV rays and ozone, we are already protected. We, the ancient Egyptians, understand fertility rights and family worship and the relationship to agriculture and commerce and keeping the land further and peaceful, stay blessed. Know who is capable but necessary to accomplish this mission. And as far as the cannabis industry, look up the Plant Variety Act and the research exemption. It has already been legal and lawful. Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury, is notwithstanding. And the Senate Majority Whip is a MP and Lord of Parliament for England. So slavery and colonization is still happening, and they're still in our resources. I'm going to grab the Fourth Order. California shine a light on that. The prostitute of Babylon going against Pippin the Egyptian, the Don, have fun with it. This is empirical evidence, not anecdotal. Amicus courageous. St. Gwen, it's not just solely. We are not Leviticus 13, Lepers, T Gray, Copy that, Copycat, Nightmare, Two Services, not Elemental Five Government, Arthur Cosmo, Cosmo, Irrecall, Embassy Records, Exonerate, Mature Cal, Breathe In, Oxygen, Breathe Out, Carb Dioxide, Peace. Sir, thank you so much for your comments this morning, and uh, they are duly noted. Thank you. Keely, our next caller, please. Line number eight. Line number eight, your line is open. Yes. Please unmute. All right. Well, good morning, Task Force. Um, this is Truth Bay, 1619 Reparations Project, on IG, 1619 Reparations. So uh, Dr. Amos Brown did not show up today because he didn't want that smoke. Overall, we're going to just break it down here. Um, NAACP received $50 million from Wells Fargo last month for their retirement plan. So you have Reverend... Arnold G. Townsend, Jonathan Z. Butler, Yolanda D. A. Williams, Cassie Cook, Reverend James Parrish Smith, Catherine Bradford, and Ruth Mays, all from the SFNAACP. Now, I agree with you, uh, Brown, that you should not give reparations without a plan. The $5 million of San Francisco, as you stated on Roller Martin, yes, there was no concrete plan for you guys to agree on it. But the NAACP since 1909 was created to have a plan for the advancement of colored people. But you use black issues to rise above. And as Wells Fargo stated, this is the biggest donation to a civil rights organization for a black American. That's what Wells Fargo put out. Do they know that you're not fighting for blacks, that you're fighting for colored folks? So please uh, stop blowing smoke, sir. I respect my elders, but I don't respect you getting your funding for your retirement plan and then denying reparations for everybody else. And then you want to backtrack. So yes, there is a conflict of interest. And our chairman, Henry Bishop Williams, said it best. No offense, but some people need to be in jail. So as we continue for us to actually get the reparations. NAACP, we're requesting you nationwide to focus on a plan, write your plan. Even the church pastors, all of you reverends out there, you should be writing the plan for the black community you serve. So when it comes time for reparations, you say, here, here's our plan for black Americans. Here's our plan. Instead thank of you. denying, delaying, and not writing nothing, it's unacceptable. Thank, thank you so much so for your, thank you for your comments. Party. We need to go to the next line. Keely, next speaker, please. We'll go to line, line number 15. Yes, greetings and good morning, task force. Um, I urge you to conduct, I urge this esteemed task force to hold additional meetings in Antelope Valley as requested by Madam Chair, especially considering the percentages of Blacks um, in Palmdale are, Palmdale are now at 12.35%. Lancaster is 16.86% in comparison to other cities like San Diego and San Francisco. Um, also, we need to have a few more meetings in Antelope Valley because there's egregious uh, racial harms that are taking place. 
especially in schools where our Black students are being called the N-word. We're having so many racial harassment cases that are coming up, not in, only in Antelope Valley, but throughout the entire state. So we really, really need to look at the amount of harm that's taking place in our schools. I encourage the task force in the California DOJ to look into the unprecedented cases or the unreported cases of racial harassment and assault. And we also need to focus on Dr. Margaret Fortune's plan for public schools. And I'd also, I'm, I'm using also a lot because there's a lot, but we also need to avert a significant amount of funds for education reparations to go towards community schools and African-centered and private schools, because at the end of the day, Black educators know how to educate, love, and care for our youth. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keely, next line. We'll go next to line number 36. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can. Okay, thank you. Hello, thank you for this opportunity. I've been trying to participate during this task force public comment session since January without success. And I'm here to represent a perspective that I haven't heard when watching the hearings online. My name is Fatima Gilliam. I'm a third generation Californian. I'm the descendant of slaves whose family has been in the United States since 1630. My grandfather, Alfred Hassan, was a California state track champion in 1930. And my great aunt, Zaino Hassan Spencer, was the first black female judge in the state of California, the first on California's Court of Appeal. Both my parents grew up in Los Angeles. All five of my siblings were born and raised in California. I was born and raised in Berkeley. I'm a lawyer and a diversity consultant. And in law school years ago, I authored a 70 page paper making the legal argument for reparations. And I've also written a book entitled Race Rules, What Your Black Friend Won't Tell You. That's coming out in January, 2024 that discusses reparations. I've shared this background to demonstrate the credibility behind my forthcoming statements, my long-term dedication to reparations as an issue and my deep ties and roots in California. California has shaped who I am, including the racist traumatic experiences I endured as a child and young adult growing up in California. The first time I was called the N-word was in Berkeley. I witnessed the LAPD harass and incarcerate relatives. And it's unfortunate that links, harms linked to education aren't included in the scope of your mandate since there is great impact <clears throat> on life's opportunities or lack thereof, and the state is littered with the racist emotional and financial stain of countless Blacks like myself that were subjected to at schools as collateral damage. My family's condition has been directly impacted by the systemic racist experiences across many generations, impacting our physical and emotional health, our inability to create intergenerational wealth, and our inability to afford home ownership in our beloved home state. I went through school in California, including enduring many openly racist teachers who made me the target of their white supremacy. But I no longer live in California, but return frequently since I'm, it's still my home. I'm here to represent the voice of Californians who have strong ties to the state, but were pushed out, driven out, or priced out. I'm so sorry it's to interrupt of the you in the middle of your sentence, but um, we're out of time. However, just know that there's public comment tomorrow. Feel free to try to call back in tomorrow, and your written comments are always welcome at reparations task force at doj.ca.gov. Thank you again. Keely, next, next line, please. Line 54. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we Good can. Good morning. Excellent. My name is Audra Walton, lifelong resident of California. Uh, currently, the state of California's minimum wage is $15.50 an hour. If we use this figure to adjust for inflation specific to the state, I believe we can bring greater perspective to reparations owed to the American descendants of slavery. Let's do some math. Most foundational Black Americans that were born into slavery began working at plus or minus age 10. They worked on average of 10 hours a day for plus or minus 362 days a year. For this math exercise, let's say the SBA survived 35 years of torture and trauma, 
under the American slavery system and retired at the age of 45. To adjust for the cost of keeping a slave, we will take today's federal, state, Social Security, and Medicare out of the annual pay, and leaving us with $44,609.58 take-home pay at 35 years. That's $1,561,335.30. Because the American Freedmen's pay was invested into our country and the state instead of being paid to them, we should be assuming interest. If we use today's federal parents left loan for college students at 7.54% for 99 years, reparations would be $13,216,076.18. If we apply 2.2% compounding interest, reparations would be $13,462,781.57. 99 years is my only arbitrary number. Slavery ended 157 years ago, and doing that math leaves us with applying 7.5% simple interest to that balance due amount of $1,561,335.30 for over 157 years, I'm sorry, for 157 years for a total of $20,044,106.37 or 2.2% compounding interest giving us $47,564,919.65. There are a couple of um, formulas for you. Thank you so very much for doing this work. I appreciate you and your time. Thank you. And your consideration. Thank you so very much for your comments this morning. Um, Keely, next, next line. Line number 58. Hi. My name is Charles Jameson. Um, black people in the U.S. have a spending power of around $1.6 trillion. Because we don't have our own core economy, we don't retain much of that. Generational wealth is built on long-term strategic planning. Strategic planning is done through sound economic practice. If we, as foundational Black Americans, are given reparations without having a sound economic infrastructure, the money will not be retained and turned into generational wealth. The proof is in the $1.6 trillion spending we do every year. I have formed an economic plan that will put us as reparation eligible black Americans on track to generational wealth. The core of every economy is the bank. As a entrepreneur, I think in terms of competition and the strategy of the team, the team obviously needs a central bank that would need a charter. Not only will we need a bank charter, but we would need a city to operate in. O.W. Gurley started Black Wall Street with 40 acres. I have 56 acres of commercial property in Imperial County, California, that is surrounded by unincorporated land that I am looking to form into a city or special district named La Viva Ritchie. La Viva Ritchie will be built on green energy and set the standard for the world. La Viva Ritchie will house the majority of the Salton Sea, which has the potential to supply 44% of lithium needed to produce batteries for electric vehicles. With the help of Governor Newsom and other California legislators and officials, we can make this a reality. La Viva Ritchie will rival international cities like Las Vegas and Dubai. I am also working on projects that will bring billions of dollars of revenue to California and the proposed La Viva Ritchie area, starting with a outdoor special event center similar to Coachella that will host the annual June team celebration and possibly the Hip Hop Hall of Fame, along with eight other large-scale events like the 4th of July and Memorial Day thank you. celebration. I hate no, to interrupt it, you in the middle of your sentence, but thank you so very much for your comments this morning and taking the time to share with the task force. Keely, uh, next line. By number 31. Line number 31, your line is open. Oh, all right. Good morning. This is Friday Jones. My name is Tasha Jones Muhammad. I'm the president of the National Assembly of American Slavery Descendants, founding member of a coalition for just and equitable California, and the uh, vice chair of Los Angeles's reparations task force appointed by Mayor Garcetti. Today, my comments are my own. 
I am going to ask three things. One, I would like to this task force while you're in your final phases to consider allocation and recommendations for Allensworth, a historic uh, Black African-American town established here in the state of California that has a national park that's falling apart, that has water problems that the state is not dealing with. And this body has the ability to make right historic wrongs. Uh, two, I am going to ask that the language that is universal or Black or race-based in all of the recommendations that have been put forth by this task force be made specific to the beneficiary class full stop. All the policies should be for uh, African-Americans descended from persons enslaved in the United States, also known as American Freedmen. The last thing is I need this task force to really get ahead of a lot of the misinformation that is out there. Daily Mail, I don't even know who their reporters are. I don't know if they actually come to these hearings and pay attention, but the things that are being put forth by some of the press, that are being put forth by organizations that do not have a vested interest or the best interest of American freedmen at heart need to be set right. That is my time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Keely, uh, next line. Line number 39. Yes, good morning, LaDonna Williams. Um, first, I want to say to Dr. Brown, shame on you. Absolutely shame on you. God Almighty, for those of us that do follow him, we all know he detests a forked tongue, which is what you have spoken throughout this process. And you've attempted to blame everyone else for what you put forward, which was sabotaging this process against descendants of slavery, Black Americans in this country. We are due these reparations. You have attempted to sabotage those for your own interests, your own government-funded programs that have taken advantage of poor and elderly. That's why you're going so hard for these programs that keep our people enslaved. We are gonna be released through this and we hope that this task force sees through these antics that you have continually put forward. You give us these fiery speeches only to turn around as Judas did Jesus and betray us. What we're asking for those of us that are deserving and are entitled to these benefits because you say you wanna hear from the people, well, we're the people. We want you as a task force in California to match these beginning payments of reparations, match that $5 million with ongoing payments and upkeep. As, as the economy changes, so should our payments increase like you do for the Indians. We want the foundational uh, Black Americans descendants of slavery to be made a protected class. We want our reparations to be tax exempt. We also are entitled to land acquisition as today is being given to Indians, not even back to them because it belongs to us, but you sidestepped us. And last but not least, his symbol him being in Ghana with VP uh, Kamala Harris, whose administration has done nothing for black folks, is a symbolic Thank gesture. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. I'm sorry to have to cut you off. Keely, uh, next line, please. Line number 30. Hi, right, thank you. Uh, thank you for the task force. Uh, my name is Michael Crockett, and I regret not being able to be there. I am caring for a newborn, African-American, infant, healthy. So con thank you for the congratulations from the panel. Um, I have three quick points. <clears throat> And I do regret not being able to follow this uh, panel as closely, the task force as closely. At the last meeting, I heard definition of descendant, and I wasn't quite sure I heard correctly. I thought I heard that uh, there was a cutoff on who would be entitled to any reparations or programs or whatever um, restitutions would be available. And my understanding was that it was a cutoff of 1865, meaning that a person had to be a slave in 1865. I hope I misheard, because let me offer this. Uh, what about colored troops who fought for freedom in the Civil War? 
Many of them joined in 1862. I hope I'm not arguing, just arguing a, a moot point. But by definition, when they joined the service, they were no longer slaves. Some critics argue that your definitions are forcing African Americans to prove how black they were, how much of a slave they were. Uh, are we, if my understanding of this definition, are we punishing by exclusion descendants of these colored troop veterans because they dared fight for freedom? If so, and I'm not arguing a moot point, that I consider that a mockery of the intent of the entire task force. Uh, there are other examples. Slave owners who provided, who would free half of his slaves and sh provide for their um, shipping through the ACS back to Africa. And then the other half, they had to work. Required them to work 15 years, and after which they would be given their freedom. So this Sir, I'm so sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your um, thought, but thank you so much for taking the time to um, get on the line today. Keely, our next uh, caller. Line 77. Good morning, Task Force members. My name is Ernest Russell, and I'm calling in just to leave a few comments. Uh, the first few will be, I would like for the task force to make sure all reparations plans are specific to the descendant community and that no universal or race-based plans are allowed. In addition, I ask the task force to do more to fight reparations, misinformation and disinformation. And I also wanna thank you guys for voting for the Freedmen Affairs Agency and choosing lineage-based reparations as eligibility. Um, in addition to those comments, I would like to also chime in on agenda item number seven and state that I agree with the compensation approach where cumulative reparations compensation would be paid to the eligible class, as well as specific reparations compensation and restitution for individual provable harms. I think those are the best approach to ensuring that, you know, reparation is not only uniform, but in specific cases where provable individuals are also able to be re, uh, reimbursed or compensated for the harm that their families endured as uh, specific you know, individuals. Um, my other comments is also to uh, support or actually encourage the task force to consider uh, historical or legacy Californians in the residency requirement if one is established. I think based upon the task force's current recommendations in the draft, that you guys would say, uh, you guys would define residency based on a domicile requirement. And I think that AB 3121 states that the harm inflicted on individuals in California as a result of the actions by California would include or uh, would include, or at least, um, I think it would include the legacy California population that has been uh, excluded from this you know, consideration. And then my last comments are going to be towards the uh, agenda item number 11, which seeks to I, recommend I'm, to I'm the so legislature. I'm so sorry to, to have to interrupt you, sir, but feel free to try to call in again tomorrow or submit your remaining comments through the um, email address. Again, thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Keely, next, next caller, please. Line 23. Hello, yes, can you hear me? Yes, you can. Okay, it's sad that we are moving away from King's dream of being judged by the content of your character instead of the color of your skin and moving towards a society where only race matters. We have become obsessed with defining everything in terms of race, using it as a crutch, an excuse for not taking advantage of opportunities. We have developed an entitlement mentality and never has it been put on display more than with this disgraceful reparations board. Bottom line, one, slavery ended 160 years ago. It's wrong to ask taxpayers, many from families like mine, who came to the U.S. after slavery ended, to pay for the wrongs of slavery. There is no causal link. The people involved have long since died, both perpetrators and victims. African-American problems today are not the legacy of slavery or even racism. Many blacks are succeeding. Poor African-Americans are victims of their own choices, the breakdown of their families, and choosing dependence on social programs. This reparation scheme further disincentivizes them from taking advantage of what is available to them and will not fix the root cause of their problems. And three, 
The U.S. has spent trillions on affirmative action programs, minority quotas and goals, college entry advantage, subsidized housing, health care, employment development, and least we forget, general social welfare programs where there is no doubt a substantial fraction goes to individual African Americans. Do these programs count as reparations? But the better question is why haven't decades of these special advantages and privileges worked for African Americans? Why do 50% of black children live with a mother only? Children in fatherless homes are more likely to drop out of school, commit crimes, use drugs, be a burden on society. Fix that, which leads to poverty. And poverty is linked to the lack of education. Why are Africans Americans not taking advantage of educational opportunities, especially in California? Fix that. And homicides. 90% of black homicides are committed by fellow blacks. Fix that. I am sure wrong has been done decades and centuries ago. It has been done to all races, to my ancestors, to myself. Where do reparations start and stop? You are creating a racial divide and exploiting white Thank you guilt. so much for your Shame comments. You. Uh, your time is up. Next caller. We'll go next to line number 14. Good morning. My name is Mecca Morgan, and I'm a real estate broker licensed in the state of California. I would like to bring to the attention of everyone Assembly Bill 1466, signed by Governor Newsom. This bill requires the removal of racist and restrictive language from all property deeds in the state of California, some dating back as far as 170 years ago. This is very alarming because these historical records are irrefutable evidence of racial discrimination in housing throughout California and can be used by the task force to assist in legitimizing the reparative justice that we are seeking. Such removal of these historical facts are detrimental because this bill legally deletes the truth. Please take some time to learn more about Assembly Bill 1466. Thank you. Thank you. Keely, next caller. Line number 19. Hello. Are you able to hear me right now? We are. All right. Uh, to Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee, I thank you for your celestial efforts. We should all recognize that many before us have dedicated their entire lives to the forthcoming study. I need you to know I appreciate your work. To all of you, Madam Chair, Task Force, and contributors, thank you. Success is in the measure we enable. My name is Prentice Johnson. I'm an author, graphic design artist, and aspiring entrepreneur. In Minneapolis, we wait anxiously to receive the torch that the elders have illuminated. I've written an autobiography and offer it as a way to replenish the United States economy. No matter the book's actual value, it's just a small piece to the great puzzle. No. Many people will continue to suffer in hope that those who understand are able to reach a proper conclusion. What we are reaching is a form of long-term greatness. Our contributors will take a holy stance in history. All will not directly benefit, but enable human progress, not just Black. Grant ourselves the right to reach our grand potential, not just happiness. We need to make a conscious effort to change our way of thinking. Mostly, we need to label ourselves. I identify as American Indigenous of Advanced Melanin. There's something stable in a bliss far beyond the pursuit of happiness. This is the time. Blessings and success. Thank you for your comments. Keely, next line. We'll go, on, we'll go on next to line 65. Line 65, your line is open. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, I will be very brief in regards to all of this. I strongly believe that California was never a slave state. The issues that you are addressing should be 
uh, put upon the federal government. This is an issue that the federal government should be handling. The state of California should not be responsible for these issues. Plenty of other states have done this to the um, people. I strongly believe this. I don't believe this is an issue that should be addressed by the state and have the burden of the state pay for this. I am not denying in any way in regards to the racist issues that have happened in this state and the problems that this state does have. But as far as the restitution goes, I believe, strongly believe, that it is a federal issue and should be addressed by that. Thank you. Thank you. Next, next caller. Line 64. Hello. Can you hear me? Your line is open. Okay, so as we approach the day of the pro uh, proposal release, I ask the task force if the body is extended for another year, what becomes of the role of the task force? Will it behave in an advocacy role to push legislation that comes out for the um, out of the proposal report? Obviously, most of the groundwork will have to be done by the grassroots organizers, but if those organizers have a central designation to funnel the organizing efforts that already have attachments to sitting legislators, that could be an invaluable resource. I also think it is the role of the task force to make sure that rep uh, reparations as a concept is kept clear in the public. That means calling out current projects that are being called reparations but fall short, such as the case with the Evanston housing program. Evanston has been pushed into the mainstream along with Robin Ruth Simmons, who recently had to go back and vote for a direct uh, pay payment option in lieu of a glorified housing program after potential recipients were written out or um, at threat of being ineligible. Finally, reparations should be lineage-based, specific to the, uh, the descendants of U.S. chattel slavery, not a class-based program, an all-black all blacks program. If black immigrants feel like they have a claim, they, then that claim needs to be adjudicated separately and apart from a lineage-based reparations claim. Uh, there was a woman, uh, an African woman, interviewed on the BBC out of London. She claimed she had family in San Francisco who were part of the Akan tribe, and that the Akan tribe were heavy profiteers in the slave trade. She herself called out the irony if her slave trading family members also got uh, also got to receive uh, benefits from the repair. Please make sure that um, that when uh, generating the proposals, that the proposals meet the eligibility uh, eligibility criteria. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next caller. Line forty seven. Line 47, your line is open. Please go ahead. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi, my name is Leslie May. I live in Antioch, California. Um, I lived in Berkeley in the 50s and moved to Oakland, California in the 60s. Um, I now live in Antioch, California, which is um, in Contra Costa County. First question, I, first thing I would like to say is that I would love for this committee, I appreciate you all, I'd love for the committee to come out here and and um, have a one day seminar conference or something because this is the one of the most racist counties there is in California. Um, I am a black female physically disabled person. I was born that way. So I have faced Racism, I faced every kind of horrific uh, uh, physical attack during the 50s and 60s, living in Berkeley and in Oakland. Now, as a 71-year young woman, um, I have been in a mental health therapist during this time. I noticed that with when talking about reparations, no one has mentioned, um, including uh, mental health services for African Americans that are descendants of slaves. We have generational slavery going down. I heard a woman speaking about crime and single fat, single parent families, and all of that. Well, guess what? That started back in slavery, and that started when 
people were free from slaves, uh, you know, being freed, the women and their husbands and sometimes their children were separated miles, states apart, and they had to find each other. So this is a directly attributable to slavery. But I just want you to make sure that you put in your action plan more mental health services for African Americans, which we lack all over, thank, all over the United States. Thank you so much for but, your comments this morning. Thank you. All right, thanks. Uh, Keely, uh, let's go to the next caller. Line 21, your line is open. Line 21. I'm calling with the California Black Power Network. I would like to comment today to address the creation of an government-regulated oversight agency over the Freedom's Bureau. If we give the authority and full responsibility for implementation into the hands of a government agency, it leaves these programs and policies vulnerable to changes in elected leadership, budget priorities, and other government transitions. It is not a wise decision to give the importance and given the importance and significance of reparations. An agency is beholden to state leadership, funding, and other potentially detrimental factors. It is important to consider how we are safeguarding against those changes to ensure not only that Black folks remain in control, but also have agency over reparations implementation that isn't dismantled by, poten by conservative leadership, for example. I advise the reparations task force to consider these very important questions. How are we maintaining control of the Black community over reparations, and how can we protect this process? Reparations are a necessary step for Black people to begin to heal and an opportunity for California to begin to right the wrongs that has, it has inflicted on Black Californians. Reparations policy in California will not only benefit Black Californians, but will encourage, impact, and guide future reparations policies for the rest of America and throughout many other countries. We cannot afford to get it wrong. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Keely, next caller. Thank you. And for any late callers that have joined, you can press one, then zero to get in queue for your phone comments. We'll go next to line number 72. Hello. Hello. Your line is open. All right. Good morning. Um, my name is Velma Levingston, and I just want to say I appreciate everything that the tax force is doing, and I'm trying my best to keep up with everything that's going on. I wanted to be present in the meeting this morning, but however, I was not able to attend due to something sort of came up, you know, last minute. And also I wanted to uh, let the task force know. And I, I, do, I, I do not appreciate the way Reverend Brown is coming at this particular situation, um, denying money to the people of color whom, and I don't want no organization over no money for me, okay? Because I came from, El Dorado, Arkansas, with two kids and some clothes, okay, from welfare to millionaire. And I am a commercial investor. And what I would like to see is that every African American have a home to go to and whatever they need. Because I know I was brought up very poorly. I know what an outside toilet is. I know what a number three tub is, okay? But I thank God for where I am today. And I want them to know I am willing, you can nominate me willing to help any African American get off the streets of Oakland and anywhere else. I would be more than willing to help them get become homeowners and home ownership and places for them to live because I think it's ridiculous as much money here floating around in California and we got all these homeless people out here on the ground. And I know you guys are going through a lot. I'm listening in to all these conversations and stuff like that. But yes, we do deserve payment, not to no organization, not to no NAACP, because I've reached out to them before. They don't help you do anything, nothing, okay? I have a son that was incarcerated for 17 years for nothing. I helped him through that. He come out now, got a job and doing good, okay? And I have another son and a daughter who's doing good. And thank, I was thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for your comments this morning and taking the time to call in. The task force really appreciates it. Keely, we have time for a few more callers. Uh, next, next line. Line 60. Your line is open. 
Um, hello? We can hear you. Yes. Um, I was born here in California, but my second and third grandfather, they were also enslaved in Virginia, Pennsylvania. Um, they also owned property. They did serve in the war. Um, my third great grandfather got married to uh, to the female, uh, you know, his wife, and they both had to have permission from slave owners to get married. They also had land. My great grandmother had 22 children, uh, which is one of my grandfather. Um, they did come from a path of slavery, but I'm not saying that's an excuse for blacks to you know, be suffering. The thing is, property was handed down to us, but was taken back. We were ran off the land. My ancestors were ran off the land. So they left property behind. That became owned by the white people. They never had a chance to leave any kind of inheritance to the generations that we are now. So therefore, we have taken a great loss um, as far as property ownership in Pleasanton, California. They're majority white. That is unaffordable for a person that's making even thirty, forty dollars an hour in California. They make everything go up so that you can't afford to live in their neighborhood. If it's, if it's affordable, they will make it unaffordable. You can buy a house. You can go to buy a house. Uh, a white person probably would need nothing down or two thousand dollars down. But when a black person go to buy a house, we need all this kind of income and all this information. We need twenty thousand dollars down on the same house. I can have excellent credit just like a white person. So here in California, uh, prices are ridiculous. But if we had inherited what was left to us, we would have had a head start to be where they are to own, to be property owners. As far as uh, reparations being paid, they didn't tell the, the uh, Mexicans to what to do with their money when they got paid from Wells Fargo. They Ma'am, the thank you. Thank you so much for your comments this morning. Thank you. Uh, Keely, next next line. Line 37, your line is open. Hello? Hello? The Hi. line is open. Hi. My name is Cheryl Randolph, and I have a want to talk to the committee. You need to be clarified about this San Francisco thing, because I'm a, just a typical black person, and every time you talk about reparations, you say San Francisco. But I was raised in lived in San Francisco all my life, but then they pushed us out. we all over the Bay Area. Are we still qualified for this reparation because after they pushed us out? Because it's not very many black people living in San Francisco now, okay? Because like I said, I lived in Hunters Point where all the chemicals was out there. I grew up in San Francisco. I had all my children in San Francisco. I went to school in San Francisco. So are we qualified for this reparation? Because you keep on saying San Francisco. And that, that's, that's what needs to be clarified for the people that's living in, that's been moved out to Antioch, Pittsburgh. They need to know they are still qualified for this reparation. Are you just talking about people that's living in San Francisco now? But what about the people that came from the South with their children? They grew up there. They lived there all their life. And Hunters Point, you know they got all kind of chemicals there, causing people to hit cancer. So that's my question. Explain yourself when you say San Francisco. Because like I said, a lot of San Francisco people was pushed out of San Francisco. Thank you very much. Thank you. Keely, uh, let's go to the next line. Line 57, your line is open. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Deidre Beltramp, and I'm, I, am, I am an African-American, and I'm proud. Secondly, as a race, we didn't climb the wall to get here to America, uh, to America land and free. We're supposed to be free. And until we're free, nobody's free. The Constitution is alive, and really, who are we the people? We were... Um, brought here under heinous conditions, work without pay, wives, children, sisters, grandmothers, uh, mothers, and our men were beaten, sold, killed, raped, and taken um, and split apart 
away from one another as a family and pitted against one another, which was unfortunately, which unfortunately had left Americans bitter down into the generation with little in, or inadequate, um, no um, psychological help, medical treatment to deal with these um, unfortunate um, circumstances. Caucasians won't even uh, admit the uh, unjustification and the wrongs uh, that they have done to our race. Um, black kids, that's one that black kids would be taught in schools. And yet, my eyes, my eyes, um, and yet my eyes just mean, in my eyes, just means that this, this would happen again if, if, if we let it. Racism is real. Have some, uh, here are some facts. As it stands today, of uh, uh, geographical uh, disparities in, in Oakland, Rail, Richmond, um, there are only one shelter um, for blacks, for people, period. You go further north, I'm in Marin. If you come up here and go further north, there are many people, um, there are many shelters and many people, and they're 24 hour shelters. Black people have to be out by six o'clock in the morning, no food, no nothing. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for your call uh, today and for your comments. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you. Keely, next line. Line 32, your line is open. Hello? She took herself out of queue. We'll go. Or, no. There, your, your line is open. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So uh, I wanted to call and uh, kind of speak on some of the things that are some of the comments that I keep hearing. So the first thing is money has to be number one in regards to a cash payment because that is the only universal equalizer. It is universal and transcends generations. So I am 45. My mother is 70. Um, my grandmother is in her 90s. We are not going back to school. So just offering saying education could be a reparation is not gonna work for us. Second, um, this notion that there was not slavery in California, that is incorrect. Slavery is said to have come to California during the gold rush, but even that's not totally true. It was actually here before. And if we actually start admitting that some of the indigenous people here were of African descent and were here prior to the slave ships, then we know that some of the indigenous people that were enslaved here in California under Spain were melanated people. Another thing, um, this thing that uh, this is divisive and that you know black people are just not taking advantage of opportunity, that is an oxymoron because if you look at Europeans, unfortunately, they are trying to get away from the fact that there were things that gave them legs up. You had things like the um, in Massachusetts Bay where plantation rights um, in six, uh, six square mile tracks were given to worthy individuals. You had in Maryland, Virginia, established 50 acre land grants. You had a federal ordinance in 1785 that authorized the sale of 640 acre tracts to settlers for $1. You had the federal government establishing liberal and credit privileges in the Western territories for a dollar an acre. Slaves not eligible, blacks were not eligible for this. You had the Federal Preemption Act grant land sellers' rights purchased at the 160 acres each for a dollar twenty-five per acre. Thank you. you. Had thank you so Act. much. I'm Federal sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your sentence, but thanks so much for your valuable comments. Um, Keely, we have time for two more callers before we switch to in person. Go ahead. Line 99 is open. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I want to play something for my submission. My name is Ms. Inga Griffin. I want to address as some prefacing with this presentation of the public education plan. And it goes to the issue of the, the vote on lineage in March of, of 2022. And I think there's been some legitimate concerns spoken about that. And I just wanted to clarify if there, you know, to remove any doubt. Um, for both myself, for Cheryl Grills, and I think for every task force member, on the lineage question, the eligibility issue, the task force has spoken. The task force has spoken. 
And uh, as far as I can see, every task force member, including myself, intends to carry out the will of the task force. Period. And so uh, I will say, and maybe this matters less, but from a from a personal point of view, the um, reality of a specific harm class of descendants, foundational Black Americans, needs to be acknowledged that heretofore has been invisible, that has falls at the bottom of every metric in California that matters, absolutely has to be recognized. And whether that's in compensation or uh, policy, um, I, we believe that. And, and Member Grills believes that too. Uh, but I, the reason I say it's sort of secondary, because it doesn't matter. The task force has spoken. And every task force member, uh, I think, is duty bound to carry out the will of the task force. That's the purpose of de deliberation, that's the purpose of voting. And once the body decides the direction, that is the direction. Thank you so much so, for your comments this uh, morning. I'm um, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of your uh, statement. Next uh, caller, this will be our last uh, speaker for in, for our online commenters. Keely? And that, that will come from line 115. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you, Task Force. My name is Cynthia, and um, I'd like to get straight to the point. Um, the harm, the cause and effect. We're the only people, you guys, where our identity were stolen, and we're the only group of people that have our slave owners' names. So that's where it should start because I, of, of the identity. And I also want to talk about the policy. Our liberation was under the 13th Amendment. That was our liberation. But instead, that clause that's there, it re-enslaved us. It, it allowed, the slavery was abolished, except the punishment of a crime. So we were always hunted, always, you know, um, hunted down for just being anything we did. Get married, do this, you punish, you do this, you do this. that's a crime, that's a crime. So that legislation right there, when you wrote legislation, when the United States did that, that re-enslaved our people. So that's unconstitutional right there. So I'm asking for that to be removed and replace because it's unconstitutional. I'm asking for a trust fund. I do want direct cash payments, land grants. That was 200 and some years to 400 years of free slave labor. Nobody in the United States has been treated like this. So those are crimes against humanity. And I'd like to see, um, I, I just want to thank you guys. You guys have done an awesome job and we must get the legislation removed, replaced and compensate. And that's what I have for our people and definitely put in a protective class of people. I mean, we're, we're, we're constantly antagonized. We go to work. You know, you can't get a, a decent job because of the color of your skin because the antagonizing continues. It is day. It's from the coworker. It's from here. It's from the, you go into any area, try to buy a home. There's, there's laws put in place. So we, we definitely must be put in a protective class of people. And I do think that when we do, um, when that does happen, birth certificate eligibility must be mandatory be born black on that birth certificate for foundational black americans thank you and, uh, because the legislation thank you so much i'm so sorry to um have to uh you have to end your statement but thank you so much for calling in this morning keely thank you for your assistance this morning we really appreciate it and we are now going to be moving into the in-person comments so again those of you who are in attendance today um, when you checked in this morning, you should have received a number card. I will call the first five uh, speakers. Uh, number one, Reginald Rom Romaine, Kim Mims, Chris Lodgen, D, and I believe I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Vapor. Or first five, if you have a number one through five, please come forward. And you will have two minutes. I'll let you know when to begin. So Reginald Roman, Kim Mims, Chris Lodgen, D, and Vapor. So if you have number one, please come to the mic. Go ahead, please. Good morning. Oh, good morning. Can we keep this off record just real quick? It's, it's, it's showing a lot of friction with these phone calls before us. We, we spend time and money. You've seen my face since 11th meeting. 
We spend our time and money to come here. And for them to get priority over us as they sit in these glass houses and throwing rocks, I just want you guys to understand something. You're, I'm sorry, your time's started, so oh, but feel, oh, but feel well, free. Record because I'm no, just, everybody but we need you question. to go ahead and begin your comments. Thank you. At the very same time that America refused to give the Negro any land, through an act of Congress, our government was giving away millions of acres of land in the West and the Midwest, which meant that it was willing to undergird its white peasants from Europe with an economic floor. But not only did they give the land, they built land-grant colleges with government money to teach them how to farm. Not only that, they provided county agents to further their expertise in farming. Not only that, they provided low interest rates in order that they could mechanize their farms. Not only that, today many of these people are receiving millions of dollars in federal subsidies not to farm, and they are the very people telling the black man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstraps. And this is what we are faced with, and this is the reality. Now, when we come to Washington, in this campaign, we are coming to get our check. But not only that, we coming to get our land. But not only that, we coming to get our freedom. You guys listen up, black American. Listen up. We got to come together as one. We got to work on this 90% black on black crime. And I'm telling, I'm not challenging every black organization. Come and get with us. We just started the 1619 Reparations Party. Go to onepercentage.org. We need your time. We just got three properties yesterday at, at Riverside City as I went on Skid Row, and we went yesterday successfully and got three properties for our people. Now, we need everybody to come together. Go on that site, sign up, give us whatever you can, your time, your resources, your money, whatever. But I'm going to say this, this right here. We need our mental health care. We got to deal with these people because they can't keep going back on these streets. In Temecula, we had a, uh, a CRT uh, 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 argument. White folk gonna tell us that we can't even study our own heritage. Sir, uh, I'm so sorry to cut you off. I know you just got started, but they, but I'm so sorry. But please come back tomorrow or submit your comments in, in writing through reparations task force at DLJ.com. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next speaker, please, you may begin. Hello, everything that Reggie said, I agree um, with him wholeheartedly there, but good morning to the task force. My name is Kim Mims. I'm co-founder of Amend the Mass Media Group and a co-founding member of Coalition for Just and Equitable California, CJEC. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Opportunity of any kind is not often extended to descendant communities, which is why we are here staking our claim for reparations today. First, I want to thank the task force for voting to establish lineage-based lineage eligibility criteria for the reparations. The proposals and recommendations set forth by the task force must also meet the lineage-based criteria standard. Chair Camilla Moore mentioned that Governor Gavin Newsom has established a race and equity commission of some sort. All universal programs and policies should be placed under the racial equity umbrella and not the, in the reparations bucket. I also want to thank you for voting to establish a full service Freedmen's Agency, which will help descendant communities repair past harms and combat continued system, uh, systemic racist systems. There's a lot of misinformation being put out right now in regard to the California reparations. And the task force, DOJ, and Charles Communication Group needs to do more to challenge and correct the false narratives being spun in the main media. As someone born into a civil rights era, Generation X, like Malcolm X, I never imagined that I would be here standing here today in 2023 fighting for reparations, but here we are. So let's get into it. I know the uh, reparations task force is in the proposal stage of um, the process, and I just want you to pay very close attention to uh, three things, employment, housing, and heirs' property. 
Many of us were lured out to California. Our, our, our family were lured out to California. I'm so sorry to, to have to cut you off in the middle of your sentence, but thank you so much. Last and feel free to come back tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Next caller. Good morning. And your time is. All right, let's get to it. Chris Lawson, lead organizer and acting president, Coalition for Just and Equitable California. Ah, it's good to see y'all. So first, thank you so much for voting for the full service. As my partner said, Freeman's Agency. That was a dope vote. Thank you. Secondly, as always, thank you for supporting and voting for lineage, specificity, eligibility for California reparations. Thank you. Also, as my partner Kim said, do more to fight the misinformation. Do more to fight the disinformation. The fight for California reparations is on now. It's not waiting until the legislation comes out next year. The fight is on now. The fight for public opinion is on now. So do more to fight the misinformation. Do more to fight the disinformation that's coming out. Lastly, I don't want to see, a lot of us don't want to see, no universal nothing in that final report. No race-based nothing in that final report. Everything got to be for us. Everything. Universal plans don't work. What happens is you do something universal, and then the people with the most take the most. The people with the second most take the second most. The people with the third most take the third most. And we get nothing or less than nothing. No universal nothing. Everything specific to the descendant community. Everything specific to the people you said this is specifically for. Universal plans do not work. Race-based plans are almost certainly illegal. Race-based all black people policies are almost always certainly unconstitutional. No universal plans, no race-based plans, specifically every single thing specific to the descendant community. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next speaker, please go ahead. Good morning, everything Chris said, times three. My name is Don Bastiano and there's been several discussions around an eminent domain and the taking of land, property and businesses from black families. Many of these proceedings were initiated by the California Department of State Parks, Caltrans, the Attorney General, and other local and state entities under the false pretense of bettering the lives of Californians. We know some of the state and local entities that took property and land from black families, far too many black families to speak to individually here today. But what, are the other, but what of the other organizations that assisted in taking wealth from black families, not only here, but throughout the United States, many organizations had a permeating influence in many black communities, gaining trust, taking property, deeds, and securing others' wealth for their own. The local Sacramento chapter of the NAACP drafted a will and became the conservators of that will just a few weeks prior to the death of my great-grandfather, Pearlie Monroe, in 1963. While he lay dying in a nursing facility, the NAACP drafted Curley's will, taking $125,000 and approximately 150 acres of land, homes, a blacksmith shop, <clears throat> and orchards. And they later sold that state, and they later sold that property to the state of California and private white owners. Property and land valued at $7 million in today's market. Glad they didn't know he had land in Sacramento and Sparks, Nevada as well. Proceeds from the sale of that property went to the New York chapter of the NAACP, as well as at $125,000. Nothing staying here in California to help black families, nor any black family as far as I can ascertain. What the NAACP did do is set up an educational fund for several white children in the community surrounding Coloma. Names attached to children that upon research did not exist. When we call on organizations to assist in this fight, those that will justly push for change, advocate for legis legislation and political representation to undo the harms wielded upon black Americans. We cannot have a seat for organizations like the NAACP that have historically underrepresented black communities. I'm so sorry to, to cut you off in the middle of your statement, but feel free to come back tomorrow or submit your comments in writing. Thanks so much for taking your time and showing up today. Okay, next speaker, please speak into the mic. Yeah, first of all, the name is Vader, not Vapor. And secondly, I'd like to point out, as I always do, the obvious in the room. 
So if we look at all the camera operators in here, right, all these professional cameras representing these news agencies, how many of them are black American? How many of them are operated by black Americans? Exactly. None. So what, as we see the, the, the racism in this room, as we see the, uh, that this panel is not even going to call out their own member who didn't show up, and we know why he didn't show up, because he didn't want to get shouted down, right? How the, who, you know what? The governor's failing us. The governor appointed this panel, and his panel is failing us. Cash reparations. Cash. That's a minimum, okay? And you guys are, are not even going to speak on that. He he's supposed to represent black Americans. Is he representing black Americans? He's in Ghana right now when he's supposed to be here. What is that? And then this fake coalition, did he even speak on it? Did he speak on Amos Brown not being here or the fact that he rejected cash payments for black Americans? See? These people are, you know what? It's just, fa it's fake up in here. And the, and the governor is responsible for the fakeness. Yeah, I'm calling, I'm calling okay, you next, an enemy next, of the next, people. Okay, uh, next, next, next speaker, please. Um, okay, our next group of speakers is uh, numbers six through 10. If you have a number six through 10, please line up and approach the mic. Uh, okay, uh, next, uh, next five speakers. Come on down. Uh, we have uh, Akil McKinney, and I really apologize if I don't pronounce your name correctly. Uh, Ms. White, uh, Mr. Williams, and uh, Norma Haywood, please line up. Okay, good morning. Good morning. You may begin. Speaking to the mic. Minashitana Rajim, Bismillah Rahman Rahim. Good morning, everybody. My name is Akil Kashif L. And I'm here to just to put my statements on the record, just a few of them. If your seal and your flag, if the seal and the flag, if your nation is not in this court, the laws and the constitution, excuse me, if the seal and the flag, if your nation is not in the court, your law and constitution is not represented. Therefore, you have no protection in that court. If you are in love with slavery and injustice, just ignore that statement. Assembly Bill 3121 is civil rights legislation reimagined as reparations for African-Americans. Civil rights legislation like the Anti-Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871 or the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 or the Voting Rights Acts of 1965 are all forms of civil rights legislation reimagined as, uh, as reparations for slavery. Understand that <clears throat> without an organized political body to articulate the free wills of our people, we're rendered defenseless against all political attacks Banks capitalized the slave trade and the insurance company underwrote it. The viability of obtaining reparations for slavery is adjusted with providing remedy and recourse for sovereign immunity, statute of limitations, causation, and constitutional standing. Legislative reparations are possible. However, reparations for slavery must be pursued through the President of the United States, the, ju the, the uh, judicial branch of the federal government, and the armed forces. In closing, <clears throat> looking to the people for ideas about law will aid us and you in locating remedy and recourse previously overlooked by legal philosophers. Thanks. Thank you. Next speaker. Good morning. Good morning. It's Terrence McKinney, and I'm going to talk about the reparations. So reparations are overdue for all foundational Black Americans. Foundation of Black Americans that were killed for nothing, babies taken away from mothers, fathers killed for protecting their families, and families broken up on purpose for a profit. Medical genocide, unjust laws, and just plain out brutality. Foundation of Black Americans have helped every culture to get on their feet. Now it's, it is Foundation of Black Americans' turn to do the same for ourselves. Not just for my generation, but also for the elders that took the time and did the research and educated us and taught us our true history. Also, for the future generation, future generations to come that will lead us into the future with their heads held up high. 
I believe that $5 million in reparations is too little for the work that foundational Black Americans have done for this country and as well for other countries. I believe that $7.6 million is a number that can be used very wisely in our foundational Black American communities. 40 acres is also still a good idea, and instead of a mule, we would like a tractor. I also believe that we should know the name of all the companies that participated in the slave trade so we, foundational Black Americans, can start up our own companies. We should also be allowed to have a choice to learn our mother language other than Spanish or French in our educational classes. We have the Tut language that was started right here in America. During slavery, we have Swahili, Yoruba, Igbo, Zulu, and even Hausa. Community colleges and universities should not raise their tuition prices for the next future generations of each foundational Black American family, and we should be able to change our names to our mother land names totally for free. All types of real estate should not go up in price, but it is our land that was supposed to be for us, but as we all know, it was never given. Foundational Black Americans know all too well why all white people did not own slaves. We also know that you were not there when this happened, but we know that you are benefiting from those who helped keep slavery alive and active. To try to keep holding foundational Black Americans back for what is due for us is just another form of slavery. It is preposterous and totally absurd. We are tired of it, like our, our great ancestor, Dr. Martin Luther King, stated. We are coming for our check. But now most of us have direct deposit. So thank you for your time and listening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bishop, Bishop Williams. Good morning, Bishop Williams. Let's, let's give you a minute to get to the mic. Uh, can you can can you help um, help him uh, get to the mic? Thank you. Good morning. Look, I was in the hospital yesterday, but thank God I'm here this morning. I thank God for all of you all, but ma'am, there's something here that has to be said and something has to be done. Uh, we speak about a lot of things that's going on. But one of the main thing is missing that we don't talk about enough is the money. I heard on TV this morning that there was $80 billion for black people in the state of California in reparation. $80 billion, okay? So now, I have the proof that Oakland, California is an Egypt. I have all of that proof. Don't y'all listen to me good. I have that proof. And I, I sent a copy up there to the chair that I, we asked for 25% of all the Oakland property, Port of Oakland property, right. because the Port of Oakland was a slave camp, uh, Egypt, okay? All the city of Oakland was a Egypt in the 1800s. So, I, 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 my thing is this, and I want to build a black Wall Street in Oakland. All black business, something never happened. Even in the 1800s, when the blacks cut down over half a billion trees and built, and they built homes all over the Bay Area in five different cities, they didn't build nothing for blacks. Blacks still slept on the ground and in tents and things. You see what I mean? And matter of fact, 1825, 1925, black wouldn't even lie to go downtown. There were 2,500 white women marked downtown Oakland. 1925, to keep black from downtown. And a lot of black was hung, killed, thrown in the bay, and everything during that time. There's a lot going on that y'all don't know about, okay? I'm bringing things to the light. Okay, but and I'm asking for a total of building this town, um, building this, what I want to build in Oakland, on Black Wall Street. I'm asking y'all for $51 billion, okay, that cash money that you put up, number one, to. Thank you. So I can start building the thing that we need in Oakland here. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Bishop. It's always so nice to hear from you. Thank you for coming out today. Thank you. Okay, our next, uh, we'll just give Bishop a moment. And next we'll hear from uh, our next speaker. 
Ms. Hayward, good morning. Good morning. I'm Norma Hayward. First of all, I want to thank all the speakers except for the Karen. Reason being, well, I drive a tour bus to all these large casinos around here in California from the north to the south. And I get so upset when I hear Indian casinos, Indian casinos. We were here before the Indians were. They weren't actually Indians. Columbus Cup was drunk when he came here, thought he was in India. But we were here also getting gold and everything. What I really want to talk about is my father, the Reverend J.T. Hayward, who had the colored and white signs taken down in Blythe. I was born in 49, and my father had those colored and white signs taken down in Blythe right before he crossed into Arizona. He told me about my family, and I don't call them my descendants, my family. I read about my fourth grade grandmother after they were free. She was snatched from my mother's arms, taken into the, the big house, and she was a, the house in work. And she talks about how they were free, and as she's walking with her uncles, they're walking by piles of our people that had been slaughtered. She's walking with her uncles. Three white men approached my fourth grade grandmother and asked them if they wanted to be free. My uncle said yes, and way my great grandmother explained it, they blew their hair off in front of the six-year-old. In other words, they shot my uncles point blank with the rifle and told her she better dance or they're gonna shoot her toes off. So these casinos, which should be ours, you send me a check for every uncle that I lost for every year my fourth grade grandmother worked in the big house. You send me a check from Cash Creek, River Rock, Great and wherever, cause they should be ours. And also, um, it's, it's just so much I want to say, but my fourth grade grandmother, anyone else can read about your family, it's already in the Library of Congress in her own words, in her own words. So you, I just want my money for my, my family. They're not my descendants. They're my family my father told me about in Blythe, California, northeast of Palm Springs. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our next uh, five uh, speakers, if you have number 11, 12, 13, 14, or 15, please come forward. If you have number 11, 12, 13, 14, or 15 on your card. Um, let's see. So is number 11 here? Person who has number 11? I can't pronounce the uh, name. Uh, and the next number 12? Please come forward if you have number 12. All right, number 12, please come forward. Good morning, good morning. Please speak into the mic and your time begins. Task Force, Chair Tiffany, OMB Tiffany, I should say. Um, real simple, just direct cash payments. With all the charades going on, all the information that's coming out about Wells Fargo, the $50 million, you know, NAACP's in there and the only thing I say is just, you guys are just the fronts. You guys are just placed and plants. Like you, you guys don't have no power. I want the ones that's behind the counter, uh, behind the, uh, <laughs> behind the curtains. I want the you know who's that's back there. Tell them they owe me and mine reparations, repair, and real estate. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, I think Mr. Harrison, number thirteen. Who has thirteen? Please come forward. Go ahead, speak into the mic, and your two minutes begins. Thank you. Hi, my name is um, Theodore Harrison. So I'm a um, graduate student, a PhD student at the University of Oregon. And so my dissertation work has been on reparations, but it's also reflective of my family history. I come from a long line of educators, specifically in Mississippi, where Reverend Brown is from, and the... Uh, Lady Barbara Chess was legendary, right? Um, in educating former slaves and those uh, emancipated. Ironically, she was forced into retirement because of integration. Um, they did not accept her certificates and training. And that was also a problem with several of my family members. So my comments are kind of tailored specifically towards education and the importance of it in this plan. Not to speak of or in place of any of the other proposal before you. But if you look at a lot of the social debate right now, particularly when you look at Florida and their attempts in school, it's to miseducate our children, right? So that we fight this same fight every generation, right? Because we have a miseducated 
pool of people, right? So I implore the panel, when you're thinking about how to restore, um, how to restore and repair, it has to start also with education. If we don't have control of our education, we don't have control of our future. Um, so I think, I, I don't remember the exact Malcolm X saying, but he said, you're a fool if you let your enemies educate your children, right? That's a standard practice of the United States government. They did it with Native Americans. They did it with any population they got access to. So they said, we'll give you what you want, integration, all that, take that. But we have to educate your children. I beg and implore you not to let that happen with this. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for your comments this morning. Next speaker. Please come forward, uh, Bentley. Uh, Glender, I'm, please go ahead. You have two minutes. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Bentley Callender, and I am a, uh, an insurance agent here in Sacramento. I'm a non-foundational Black American, and I'm a legal immigrant. Um, I'm here in support of foundational Black Americans. I do agree with Chris that everything that uh, is connected to the agency needs to go to foundational Black Americans, all contracts, straight down the line. Um, as far as the full surface agency, I think that there's a piece that's missing and it is because of hate crimes against all Blacks everywhere. Um, there is no comparison with hate crimes against any other group like there is with, um, with black Americans. And the full surface agency needs to have a division where the, um, a division of protection to protect the agency and to protect the beneficiaries. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. All right, um, next speaker, Mr. Curry, please come forward. Good morning. Good morning, thank you. My name is Charlton Curry. First of all, I want to thank the task force for getting together and listening to solutions. I also agree with what was happening in San Francisco, payment of $5 million for every eligible black adult, the elimination of personal debt, tax burdens, guaranteed annual incomes of $97,000. We really need free college for our students. My family came from the South because they were running for their lives. They were fearful of being lynched just for voting. My family and other black Americans fought in every single war this country's had. From the Civil War to the war on the streets, the war on black people. So when we ask for reparations, it's happened to other countries like the Marshall Plan, happened to rebuild Europe. Now people go there for vacation. The GI Bill, for American soldiers, but you had to be white. You couldn't be black. No one fought it. The Homestead Act, land was given to white Americans and white Europeans, but you could not be black. They said, no, you're black, no. So now we're asking to be pro-black and cash payments are necessary. Money talks, and I want money in my own account. I don't need to have to ask someone else for it. We're all adult to do it, we pay taxes, we deserve the money. It's been given to other people. There are even farmers given money not to farm, but they're white and that's a shame. We need free housing. We need free health care. If you're sick, you can't function with the money. Mental health is fine too, but cash payments are necessary. I also wanna personally commend Senator Stephen Bradford your name was all over television, but they call it NIL, but they don't mention you as one of the reasons that it happened. So I thank you for that. And I hope that everybody can understand money rules everything. We just gave Zelensky $100 billion. He's not black, he's not even American. No one complained. We need our money too. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair Moore? We, we have uh, Attorney General Rob Bonta on the line who is going to join us and make a few comments. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll take a pause to acknowledge Attorney General Rob Bonta. Uh, I will introduce 
him first. On April 23rd, 2021, Attorney General Rob Bonta was sworn in as the 34th Attorney General of the state of California, the first person of Filipino descent and the second Asian American to occupy the position. Attorney General Bonta's passion for justice and fairness was instilled in him by his position. Um, and by his parents who served on the front lines of some of America's most important social justice movements. It's why he decided to become a lawyer, to help right historic wrongs and fight for people who have been harmed. He worked his way through college and graduated with honors from Yale University and attended Yale Law School. Attorney General Bonta has led statewide fights for racial, economic, and environmental justice and worked to further the rights of immigrant families, renters, and working Californians. He previously worked as a deputy city attorney for the city and county of San Francisco, where he represented the city and county and its employees and fought to protect Californians from exploitation and racial profiling. He went on to pursue elected office in Alameda County, first as an Alameda Council member and later as an assembly member representing Oakland, Alameda, and San Leandro. In the state assembly, Attorney General Bonta enacted nation leading reforms to inject more justice and fairness into government and institutions. As the people's attorney, he seeks um, accountability from those who abuse their power and harm others as one of the most important functions of the job. He is married to assemblywoman um, Mia Bonta, and they are proud parents of three children. Reina, Ileana, and Andres, as well as their dog, Legolas. Uh, without further ado, thank you so much for joining us, California Attorney General Rob Bonta. Well, thank you, and thank you for the very kind introduction. I really appreciate the opportunity to spend time with you all this morning. Good morning to you, and uh, thank you for including me. Uh, I do want to say at the outset, my apologies for not being able to be with you in person. While I am on my way to Sacramento because of weather and some unexpected delays, not able to get to you in person um, uh, this morning. And uh, my apologies again, I look forward to joining you in person at a, at a future meeting. And I wanted to begin by thanking the members of the task force, commending you for your important work. You've been charged with helping California reckon with the original sin of this country and uh, something that remains a stain on our history. You are wrestling with and grappling with how the horrors of our past created lasting harm felt by black Americans in the present day and to the present day. And that's no small order. And you've met the moment and you've risen to the occasion. So thank you for the work you've done, the work you're doing, the work you will continue to do. I also want to express my gratitude to California Secretary of State, Dr. Shirley Weber, for her fortitude and her vision in creating this task force while she was in the assembly. We joined the California State Legislature together and I was proud to work with her on many issues uh, on, and on many bills, but uh, on this one, proud to be her co-author and uh, proud that I've been able to help bring it to reality or bring it to fruition as the California Attorney General. One of my first priorities as Attorney General was to form the Racial Justice Bureau to support uh, this transformational endeavor uh, among with other efforts to create more racial justice throughout our state. And, I wanna give my sincere thanks to the members of my team who provided administrative and technical and legal support and assistance to help us get to this important point that we're at now. The Civil Rights Enforcement Section, particularly Senior Assistant Attorney General Michael Newman and his team, thank you. Special Assistant Attorney General Damon Brown, thank you, Damon. The Office of Community Awareness, Response and Engagement, thank you, Kat and Maheen and your team. Uh, the Conference Services team and everyone throughout DOJ, who's been involved in making this a success. It takes a team, uh, it takes a partnership, collaboration, working together, coming together. And uh, we've seen that. I wanna thank everyone who's been a part of that. Getting the final report over the finish line is only the first step. After that, of course, the real work begins. And DOJ is committed to internalizing and integrating what we've learned into our institution. When you deliver your findings to the legislature on June 30th, you'll be stepping into uncharted waters. Uh, never has any state government in 400 years 
of American history embarked on such an expansive effort of truth and reconciliation around the institution of slavery and its present day effects. California is leading the nation, a nation that frankly has moved far too slowly. The truth is from our earliest days, the institution of slavery has been inextricably woven into the establishment history and prosperity of this country. Even after its abolition, our government continued to perpetuate, condone, and often profit from practices that brutalized Black Americans and excluded them from meaningful participation in society. Our legacy of slavery and discrimination has resulted in debilitating economic, educational, and health hardships uniquely experienced by Black Americans today. That's why we must ask, how can we work together to form a more perfect union? That's why you're asking, how can we work together to try to remedy this generational harm and trauma? Your recommendations will play a critical role in helping to unearth history, shed light on the inequities of present day, and begin a sorely needed process of healing. This is one of those rare moments we search for our whole lives, a moment where we can truly make a difference. I'm confident the impact of your insights will reverberate across the state, across the country, and across the world. I look forward to your report. Please know until then and long after, uh, you have a partner in me and the Department of Justice. I'm honored to work with you. I thank you for the work that you're doing. I appreciate all your contributions. Thank you for the opportunity to join you this morning. Thank you, A.G. Banta. All right, now we, we will resume with in-person comments. Will the next five uh, speakers please come forward? Uh, Darlene Crumley, Ty Wilson, Gail Wilkerson, Constance uh, French, I may not have pronounced that correctly, and Matthew Morris. So numbers 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. Please come forward if you have 16, Ms. Crumley. Please go ahead, you have two minutes and please speak into the mic. Yes, good morning. Um, good morning to Chair Moore and to the entire task force members. I am Darlene Crumley, member of CJEC and Arc Bay area. I would like to thank you for holding this in-person meeting. Although it does not affect me, I would ask the next couple of in-persons be on the weekends. Friday and Saturday, so the descendant community can come. I mean, it affects them. Some have to take off for of work. So I would really, really like you to consider that again. And also, I would like to uh, make sure that when you submit the reparations proposals, that they are specific to the descendant community that has suffered the harms. We do not, and we demand not to have universal or race-based policies going forward. And also, I would like you to fight more of the reparations myths and disinformation, especially what's on the web. And I think that people are getting confused what's happening in San Francisco to this California Reparation Task Force. And I think more information needs to be put out there that these are really two separate issues going on here. And last but not least, I would like to thank you for voting for the California American Freeman Affairs Agency that will pro provide services where none is provided and will provide oversight services where, where they are being provided, retaining the option to provide direct services where necessary. You voted on this on March the 4th of this year, this month, so please hold to that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for coming out this morning. Next speaker. Please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and the work you guys are doing. My name is Ty Wilson. I'm a direct descendant of the Dollar Hyde lineage. I came on one of the very first slave boats. Um, I might not appear it, but um, I am half black. And in a lot of this conversation, everything seems to be black or white. And I ask if there's any considerations for people of mixed race. I don't believe in the race suggestions. I do believe in the lineage. Um, but we have uh, a lot of people that are mixed in this country that don't seem to be included in a lot of conversations to this day at California State Employment application. You have to pick one box. All my life I've been forced to pick white or black. I've picked black. 
and it hasn't always benefited me or hasn't been negative to me. But now when I hear this discussion about what's going on with reparations, I haven't heard anybody mention about people that are of mixed race. So I hope you consider that. I'm not the only one out there. Um, and I speak on behalf of, as far as checking a box, it's the other. And the other thing is, will there be an appeals process if you do not make selections the first time around? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks for coming out today. All right, our next speaker, good morning. Hello, my name is Gail Wilkerson. Um, I'd like to address that lady that said she came after and why should she pay into reparation? I came after slavery and I'm still suffering. Um, <laughs> My father worked at a white funeral home at 14 years old and uh, in Louisiana, the Streetport, Louisiana. And um, they would attend to the white uh, dead bodies and throw the black ones against the fence, he said. A even after that, he joined the Navy, the military, and we came out. Well, I was born in San Francisco. And um, my parents were steered down to East Palo Alto. That's where I live now. Uh, alleged former murder capital of the world. Uh, this is after Menlo Park took the right side. Palo Alto came around and took the left side and left the blacks to fend for themselves. I ran for a city council last year. I, my eyes were open. We're being gentrified. Um, I, I wasn't successful, and really. Um, I wasn't intending to win. Uh, but I'm going to win next time, 2024, because um, I'm, I'm destined. We're being gentrified. They blew up our black Wall Street, uh, Whiskey Gulch, which was created by Stanford University to keep their students from be getting drunk uh, three miles away. So now they didn't blown it up. There's a four seasons there that we're not uh, allowed to... Uh, open up a business there. It's not for the mom and pops. So um, I'd like for reparations to come in and for um, that lady who called in and said, this is still going on. We're still feeling the effects of slavery. I went to Menlo Afternoon High School. I was the only black in a lot of my classes. In fact, I had one black kid that was, uh, he got out because I guess I couldn't talk at that time. But we were going through all of that and um, we're entitled to reparation and we're entitled to um, money, land, and, um, uh, uh, and uh, the, the financial um, things that we were forced out of. I'm sorry, thank you so much for your time. Okay, thanks, thank for, you. thanks for coming down and coming out today. All right, next, uh, next speaker. Good morning. Hi, um, my name is Tiambe, and uh, I appreciate your work, um, and I appreciate everybody that's here. Um, and I want to remind us that we have to do this concurrent work. And so one of the things we have to do is unity of, of purpose. We're not going to get everything, and we don't expect to get everything from politicians anyway, but we have to stay focused. I think we can do it this time. Um, and there's a lot of great ideas. I'm, I'm glad to see the men. I hope that um, you remember the unity of purpose and power. Is that what we need? Now, as Kim um, Mim said, please extend the housing harm timeline till current 2023. Um, I, I, I wanna talk about the most significant harm and that is they took away who we are. We don't know who we are. Some Negress, Negress, N-I-G-G-A, N-I-G-G-E-R, African-American, Afro-American, uh, Afro um, all kind of um, Asian stuff. We don't know who we are. And as a result, we can't get things done. We fighting against money for our own people. What, what the hey? What is that about? You know, um, uh, we know politics is not going to save us, but we have to um, remind people. So, okay, right. People said before, Native Americans got reparations. Uh, um, Germans got reparations. Jews got rep reparations. Japanese. Japanese got rep rep reparation. The Marshall Plan. Um, uh, the uh, um, 
redistribution of land uh, plan. And no one says anything to a Chinese woman when she says Chinatown or building Chinatown, um, Afghanistan, um, uh, Ukrainian, uh, Vietnamese. They fought and they got all kinds of languages on the low part in San Jose. I mean, and then we can't get reparations. We don't even know who we are. Is that it? <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. But feel free to come back tomorrow okay, or submit your comments you. in writing. Don't the children. Don't but but thank, thank you for coming out. Thank you. All right. This should be uh, Mr. Morris. Good morning. Please go ahead. Good morning. One of the most important questions that may be asked is, what would reparations repair? When you realize that these systems that were infiltrated with hateful agendas, as is explained in this task force's executive summary, you realize that the imagery linked to my people being the pimps, hoes, drug dealers, and prisoners is not our creation. It was a fabrication created by ignorance and hatred to address anyone that is and was black as a whole. These were systems that we were largely excluded from and therefore could not fairly defend ourselves from its implementation, nor could we protect ourselves from the damage caused by its execution. For example, Hollywood, when they choose to create mass racist stereotypes in movies such as the black exploitation phenomena, perhaps reparations would replace the negative images of being criminals and jigaboos with that of business owners and leaders, such as those of the black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Now, what is the harm? The harm is clear when at least 90% of the African-American population have PTSD symptoms that transfers from family member to family member to neighbor to neighbor. This PTSD has even affected me personally because for every victim I saw a violent crime, I saw myself in the victim. For every news coverage story that covered it, I saw my likeness in the coverage. According to the U.S. Bureau of Prisons, 40% of the prison population is made up of African Americans, yet we only make up 13% of the United States population. This demonstrates a disproportionate number. How can we even begin to address these issues when our voting rights are also at risk to this day all across the country? This shows that voter suppression of the black community is still a thing alive and well in this country. We saw places like Los Angeles and Oakland riot based on these unequal conditions that threaten our day-to-day. -day. We have proof of the housing programs and banks that were allowed to mistreat us, the Black Panthers that showed us that the laws were not protecting us on equal footing. Most of the stores that operate in our community are not owned and or operated by African Americans, so how can we be a community when these institutions are not run by us? Thank you. Thank you so much for coming out. I'm so Thank sorry to... To cut you off. Thanks for that powerful information. Uh, our next speakers are group five. I need Raphael Plunkett, Alexander Brannon, Malak, Malik, Kamaji Ainsley, and Dr. Reverend Tony Pierce. All right, so please come forward. Raphael Plunkett. Is, is that, are you Raphael? Yes, I am. I'm oh, Raphael. Raphael, I'm sorry. I pronounced no your name wrong. Go good ahead, morning. please. Good morning. Good morning. It's great to see you again. It's so good to see all of you. I thank you, Task Force, and I thank you, staff, and I thank the audience. I really appreciate being here today. Joe and I are here from Diamond Bar. We're really grateful to be here. Uh, first, I want to tell you, I have my family heirloom with me. I have all of your signatures. And I have photos from when you signed the book with me. This is our family heirloom. And I first wanted to thank Assemblymember Joan Sawyer for having this for us in LA. Having this out is so important to the process. I want to thank you for your lineage-based determination. I also thank you for having the hearings on weekends and weekdays. I thank Senator Bradford particularly for SB 490, that's creative. Thank you very much. I hope it's successful. I ask that the other legislators among you, please be creative for us. Move for us in this effort. I ask that you please continue to ensure that all reparations plans are specific to the descendant community. No universal, no race-based plans, as those would not be reparations. 
Please be confident in your really tremendous efforts here and be aggressive in combating misinformation and disinformation. If we were to share this report, then we wouldn't have to sit through the hurtful comments and these violent calls for people not reading the report and not understanding that California was indeed a slave state. I thank you for your time. Please know that you are respected and supported. Thank you, thank you so much for your comments this morning. Our next speaker, please go ahead. Good morning. My name is, uh, and thank you to the task force. My name is Jay Alexander Brandon, and I'm a veteran and an American freedman. I was born and raised in Compton and South Central Los Angeles in the 1970s and 80s. Earlier this month, the task force voted unanimously to establish a freedman agency to govern distributions of reparations. In addition to cash payments, I believe the agency should also guard against freedman farming for conservatorship. Many of our freedman people who fell victims to the crack epidemic in the 1980s had good paying jobs and were homeowners. Some are veterans suffering from PTSD from their military service or from the war on drugs, war on black families, war on black fathers, and the war on black home ownership with, some plot, with subprime mortgage and lending. Many make up over, many make up over the 10,000 homeless that are living in the streets of California uh, while services and benefits are being given to the illegal immigrants. A lot of our freedmen veterans are receiving veteran benefits in the form of monetary compensation as high as $3,000 a month, along with Social Security. Because of their condition, some are placed on conservatorships and get small stipends of their money and benefits monthly, which means someone else is controlling their money. I believe the Freeman Agency, once established, should guard against this and make sure mechanisms are in place to deliver housing, provide services, and protections to the undeserved population. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next speaker, please. My name is Malik. I'm with the Moran City Reparations Coalition. And like everybody else, you know, we all have our stories, but I wanted to take my time to provide a particular invitation and a request to this board to hold some of their future hearings in the smaller outreach communities. There's still a lot of training that needs to be done and whether the whole board can make it a uh, half of it, a third of it would be fine. And Marin City is a small community about five minutes north of San Francisco that sprang up during the war years. And we've lost a lot of ground, but somehow we're still there. It's also the home of Paul and Tanisha Austin. Some of you may have heard of their case that just made national attention. They live about three minutes from me. What happened was they put like $500,000 into upgrading their home only to have it assessed at slightly more than what it was valued at before. It's also the home of, not Marin City, but Marin County, the former home of Governor Gavin Newsom, who graduated from high school and spent a lot of time hanging out there. So if you guys can consider we holding the thing in Marin City, we'd love to have you. It would help us to save our town. It would help to keep this current lawsuit in the national attention, and it would go a long ways in terms of helping us to educate people about this whole reparations movement. And I am in support of this board, maybe not everything it does, but you know how we are along the way, you're gonna hear some yeah, 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 and ooh, 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 listen to see if there's anything there. If it ain't, keep moving. We don't have time for that. Right. All right. Thank you. All right, our next, uh, next, and it appears to be our last, uh, well, next to last speaker. Ames, Ms. Ainsley, please come forward. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning to the board. Um, the name is Kamji Ansley. Um, I stand here as a third generation born Californian. My great grandmother was also born in San Francisco, California. Um, my concerns is about the report. If I was California, I'd be putting my checkbook back in my pocket after reading this report because I can see in this report what the federal government has done to black Americans, but I don't see the case made of how California violated First Amendment, Second Amendment, 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment rights from the time she scooted in to the nation in 1850 against black Californians. Um, I need a report that is specific 
to the atrocities that has happened to Californians from the time of the gold rush, gold rush and the miners. Um, those families did not disappear. Those families were robbed. I'm an heir. I'm an heir, and I should have the capital in California to have a house that hangs off the coast of Pacifica with bay windows that stretch around 20 feet from left to right, looking and counting the whales and the um, seagulls, um, teaching my grandchildren um, their ABCs as we look at the wildlife, but I have been robbed. I have been robbed of my airhood. All my money has been robbed, and I need a report from this task force that represents the robberies of the black Californians from 1850 until present day. We need to talk about the poisoning and the redlining that even my ancestors were ushered into and the atrocities of that, the cancer rate in those neighborhoods. We need to talk about the um, conflict of interest. Um, Wells Fargo got all of their money from being a slave capitalist so I'm concerned when the NAACP gets $51 million and then one of the chairs from San Francisco NAACP takes direct cash payments off. As I'm a so, heir, so I deserve sorry. direct your cash time, payments. No time is up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Our last two speakers, please come forward. Um, Reverend Tony Pierce and Andrea Jordan, and that will close our in-person speaking comments today. Good morning, Reverend Pierce. Good morning, thank you very much. Well, I think you know why I'm here. That's why I'm always coming. Where's the money? Where's the cash? Where's the check? Don't be afraid. Please don't be afraid. Five million dollars, San Francisco's already made a move. Five million dollars is nothing. And I'll tell you why. If they spread it over 50 years, that's $100,000 a year, and you're in the top tax bracket, 35% Fed, 16.8 California, you'll be lucky if you end up with $40,000 a year. We need to do this. We need to get the money. Where's the money? Let's get the money now. 223000 for housing is not enough. We're looking at just the redlining. There's predatory lending. If you're African-American, chances are you're paying more on your mortgage for the same amount of money as somebody else. And that's not right. So let's get the money. Where's the money? Thank you. Thank you so much for your comments. Our last speaker will be Miss Miss Jordan. Please come forward. Good morning. Hello, I'm Andrea Jordan, and just the idea of us having this format, everyone knows what has happened to us. You can look up under bridges, you can look everywhere in this country and see what happened to us. My great-grandfather was a sharecropper who died, who worked from sunup to sundown and died with nothing, had 17 children and died with a frown on his face from everything that was took, the laws that were created, they, 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 they took his land and created laws to keep it. Right. Everything that has happened to our people has been an atrocity in this country. And it is time you've paid everyone else and we've gotten nothing, nothing. The black man has gotten nothing here. It's time to do the right thing by us. It is absolutely time to do it. We've talked about it. You've studied. So far, the only people that's gotten paid is the study people, the people that's studying it. But what about the people? Power to the people. Thank you. Thank you so much. That, that concludes our uh, call-in and in-person comments today. Uh, feel free to come out tomorrow or any of the future meetings of the task force to make comments. And all as always, you can submit your written comments to reparations task force at doj.ca.gov. I will now turn the meeting back over to Chair Moore. Thank you again for coming out.
Thank you again, Ms. Martin Walton. Thank you, members of the public, and thank you, Attorney General Bonta, for welcoming remarks as well. Uh, the next item on the agenda is item number four, uh, action item approval of March 3rd and 4th, 2023, meeting minutes. Uh, task Force members, we've had an opportunity to review the meeting minutes from the last hearing. Um, are there any questions, comments? If none, we can entertain a motion uh, to approve the minutes as presented. Our motion to approve the minutes as presented. Is there a second? This has been properly moved by Member Tamaki and properly seconded by Member Montgomery Step that the task force approve the March 3rd and 4th, 2023 meeting minutes as presented. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will begin to call the roll, calling each of your names, and I will start with uh, Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Uh, Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Joan Sawyer? Aye. Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there are eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays and zero abstentions. Thank you. There are eight ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions, and thus the ayes have it, and the motion carries. The meeting minutes from March 3rd and 4th are um, accepted as presented. The next item on the agenda is agenda item number five, discussion and potential action, task force approval of draft report, part seven, report on racial justice act implementation and related recommendations presented by members Tamaki and Holder. So thank you, uh, Chair Moore. Uh, we're at the last, basically the last stage of the presentation of the uh, survey report. And so uh, what we have not presented to the task force and to the public are the recommendations, which are of course the most important thing. Um, there is no need, I think, for any particular um, action item in connection with this. So this is more or less a report out and um, the principal part of it is, is what the recommendations would be in the final report. Uh, just to refresh everybody's recollection, uh, we began, began this endeavor actually uh, in December of 2021. That's when the advisory committee was constituted to look into how the task force might, meet, might use its ability to compel um, responses from government or private agencies. The problem, however, is um, the short life of the task force, which as everybody knows, is gonna end as of July 1, 2023. And um, we're searching basically for how to use this and not be um, uh, in a situation where, where the people we're trying to seek the information from simply runs out the clock until we expire and we're no longer around to, to continue to push this. Many of the issues, if you were to put in litigation, uh, would take you know, more than two years. And um, some of the information we talked about getting would have been subject to um, uh, objections. 
and motions to in the court uh, process to compel, basically a lawsuit to get the information to enforce it. So um, maybe out of a half a dozen uh, possible areas that we looked at, we thought the enforcement of the Racial Justice Act would be the most amenable to getting in useful information uh, within the allotted time frame of our existence without getting mired in litigation that would extend beyond the life of the task force and uh, which would cause our process to be useless. So um, between December 21 and February 2022, we looked into areas of housing, employment, uh, insurance, uh, 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 companies that benefited off enslavement, uh, et cetera. And we thought, thought the, the one issue that would be most amenable and most need of information was the Racial uh, Justice Act. And as summarized in prior uh, reports, uh, the problem is obvious in terms of mass incarceration, and that is bias seeping into every stage of the prosecutorial system from arrest to charging to diversion to sentencing uh, and so on. And the Racial Justice Act provides remedies uh, to prove that, um, for example, uh, you know, black people are being sentenced more harshly or being charged more severely and more often than other uh, races. But that all requires data. So uh, we undertook the first step to, after determining this uh, through March through April of 2022, to draft, revise, edit, and format the survey questions to all district attorney offices in California and all of the courts. And through May through June uh, 2022 to finalize and send out those surveys in September to Oc October 2022 to actually uh, get those responses and to follow up with straggler counties that uh, did not respond. So by uh, September of 2022, uh, we're looking at first drafts of the analysis of the data we were receiving and November 2022 uh, to March of 2023. So we're now in current time. Uh, the Research Center of the Department of Justice did a lot of work uh, to, to distill what is being collected. And um, this, as far as I know, was the first attempt uh, to collect data on a statewide basis. And without that data, the Racial Justice Act and the rights uh, provided to defendants is pretty uh, empty. So that basically is the framing of it. I think um, before we move into recommendations, um, I think we see this as a necessary and good first step and that the recommendations uh, to the legislature then go to furthering um, that effort. So maybe I'll turn it over to, to Lisa, uh, member Holder to Continue. Uh, thank you, Member Tamaki. I'll, I'll start off with a with a personal anecdote. Uh, you know, I've been a lawyer for 20 years, a little over 20 years now. It's hard to believe. And I started out my legal career as a public defender um, in in Los Angeles at the Los Angeles Alternate Public Defender's Office. And I remember, you know, 20 20 20 some odd years ago, you know, going into the holding tanks, which is where public defenders would have to go to talk to their clients before we went into court um, and presented to the judge. And uh, at that time in LA, they, the, the holding tanks were separated by race. <laughs> and, you know, there was a, there was a, a holding tank for, for white people, a holding tank for Latinos, Asians, and a holding tank for black people. Though typically the white holding tank would have one person in there, one lone individual in a large holding tank. The Latino uh, holding tank would maybe have 15, 20 individuals in the same size holding tank. The Asian holding tank would have maybe three or four people, same size holding tank. And the, the African-American, the black holding tank would sometimes have over 100 people. Wow. in the same size holding tank. 
And every time I had to go in those holding tanks to talk to my clients, to try and get their story before I went to talk to the judge or the prosecutor about the arraignment, I would come out shaking because the experience was like being transported back to 1619 wow. when I would look around at each holding tank and see this holding tank full to brimming over, packed people packed in like sardines. Wow. In, similar to the images that we've seen of what it looked like in a slave ship, in the bottom of a slave ship. And it was, it was really like being transported hundreds to, to hun to centuries ago, the feeling that I would come out with as if we were still enslaved. Now, I tell that story because, you know, California has been starting to do a better job at, at you know, being a little bit more of a watchdog around policing and looking at tracking who, who is being surveilled by the police, who's being stopped, who's being arrested. But we really have not been looking at, or shining a spotlight on what's going on with prosecutors. Prosecutors have a lot of power in the criminal justice system, in a criminal injustice system. And, you know, they have complete discretion over charging. So they get to decide whether to charge someone who's been arrested. They get to decide whether, or they get to make decisions about bail. They get to make decisions about who gets a plea and who doesn't get a plea. They make decisions about who's gonna get a parole violation, who's gonna get a probation violation. And they make decisions about who's gonna get diversion, right? And that's a process where instead of actually getting charged or sentence, you get diverted. And so you get to do some community service and then you never, if you complete it, you never get anything on your record, right? And so prosecutors have a tremendous amount of power and there's also a tremendous amount of bias, bias with prosecutors. And that's you know one of the reasons why you had so many black folks being charged in those holding tanks 100 to one. Those are the disparities that I was seeing day to day. You know, there's, there's studies that show that, it, for instance, prosecutors in Los Angeles County, researchers found that prosecutors are more likely to press charges against black people than white defendants and, and determined that these charging disparities could not be accounted for by race neutral factors, such as prior record, seriousness of the charge, or use of weapon. So, it, 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 these, are, these are not race neutral decisions all the time. A lot of time race is the deciding factor about whether you're going to charge a gang enhancement that gives someone an extra 10 years or a weapons enhancement that where someone's gonna be looking at an extra 10 to 15 years. Race is often the deciding factor. We didn't make it that way. That's how it was given to us. And, you know, one of the things that you have to really be paying attention to is implicit bias among prosecutors and in the prosecution process. You know, a lot of people will be like, oh, I'm liberal. I'm not, I'm not racist. But they see a defendant that looks a certain way and they as ascribe and assign certain characteristics to that person as being more dangerous, more threatening. It's more important to lock that person away. And that has everything to do with race, those decisions. Um, you know, there, uh, a, a UCLA study by, by researchers who have been studying implicit bias in, the pros in prosecutions, they determined that the conditions under which implicit biases translate most readily into discriminatory behavior are when people have wide discretion in making quick decisions with little accountability. Prosecutors function in just such environments. They exercise tremendous discretion to decide whether, against whom, and at what level of severity to charge a particular crime. They also influence the terms and likelihood of a plea bargain and the length of the prison sentence, all with little judicial oversight. So what's missing from the process? We, we, we have this situation of bias. We have this situation of dis disproportionality. What is missing is data and uniform tracking of data, uniformity that limits discretion, that limits 
prosecutorial discretion. What's also missing is transparency, right? If prosecutors have to be more transparent about their charging decisions and other decisions, that they're gonna be a little bit more careful about whether they're letting their biases infect the process. The other thing that's missing is accountability, right? And so we have to now infuse this prosecutorial system with uniformity, transparency, and accountability. And the Racial Justice Act is an, is, is a, is an excellent vehicle because it's pre-existing, it's an excellent vehicle to now infuse the criminal legal system with accountability, transparency, and uniformity in terms of collecting and tracking data. So that's what we are attempting to do with these recommendations. I wanted to give you that background so you understand why we are recommending the things that we are recommending. Um, if we could go to the slide, the slide, uh, let's go to number six. And so what, are, what we are doing, what, what we are recommending is to ensure that the Racial Justice Act claims can be raised, right? We want to make sure that defendants, especially black defendants who are being disproportionately charged with based on biased charges and biased decision making, we want to make sure that every person who is under state supervision whether you're on, on parole, whether you're a, de a, a defendant who's defending against criminal charges, we want to make sure that these folks can access the Racial ju Justice Act. So an enhanced right to discovery in criminal cases where defendants raise Racial Justice Act claims and or defenses with a low threshold for asserting these claims in the context of criminal, criminal, criminal litigation. We don't want people to have to jump through 50 hoops to, to be able to say that I think that this is a biased prosecution. I think that it's a racially motivated and anti-black prosecution. I think I'm being prosecuted and persecuted because I'm black. We don't want people to have to jump through a million hoops to be able to say that and to be able to get the discovery they need to prove that. So we want the Racial Justice Act to be enhanced so that, that, so that there's not a lot of hoops that people have to jump through. Now, what's also very important, as I said, is accountability. And so a lot of the, the measures that we're asking for are holding, uh, shining a spotlight on what prosecutors are doing, holding them accountable, holding their feet to the fire. And one way to, to hold people to ac accountable is to penalize them if they violate the Ra Racial Justice Act. So if a prosecutors are violating the Racial Justice Act, we want them to be penalized um, as a deterrent so that it stops. So individual prosecutors who thwart the Racial Justice Act, data transparency requirements, and engage in discovery violations should be subject to penalties in the form of adverse rulings, jury instructions, and case dismissals. So if you're gonna prosecute someone because they're black and we are able to discover that using the Racial Justice Act, case dismissed. Uh, we can go to the, the, next, the next slide. We are proposing that the legislature uh, enact a Racial Justice Act Commission, similar to what we are seeing on the policing side, where we have a racial identi identity profiling act and we have a commission and a task force that, that is a steward of that process. We want that on the prosecution side as well, right? So create a commission similar to the RIPA board, racial identi identity profiling act board to track, audit, monitor, and analyze data generated by the racial justice act process. This commission could be styled as an arm of the Freedmen's Agency. We would establish key performance indicators and other quality control measures to ensure that, that prosecutors office and other officers of the court, including judges, are complying with the Racial Justice Act and ensuring that people aren't being prosecuted because they're black or people aren't being violated for parole violations or probation violations because they're black. We want, we want 
of this commission to be able to publish annual reports similar to the publications that the RIPA board does, right, on prosecutorial bias uh, for public consu consumption. So, pe so all of California can see when there are violations of the Racial Justice Act, when there's a lack of uniformity, when discretion is being misplaced and abused. We want those reports, we want that data to be able to publish so that all of California can see and hold these prosecutor's offices accountable. We also want to establish a federal nexus which ensures that California's data on prosecutorial bias and criminal legal racial profiling is uploaded and synced to national racial profiling databases. And that's really important that we have this federal nexus because we, 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 we always wanna have a landscape view of what's happening all over the country in terms of biases against black people, right? Because that's gonna help us to get reparations at the federal level, quite frankly. So when California up, when, when California is tracking this information about biases to black defendants and people on parole, et cetera, it all should be uploaded into a federal database so the federal government knows where the biases are in California and has a landscape of what's happening all over the country. Um, let's move to the next slide. I think it's eight. And then, as I said, so, so much of this is about increasing accountability and holding prosecutors' feet to the fire to ensure that they are, that they are um, using their due diligence in a way that is fair and even and appropriate and not based on anti-Black animus, which has been the case previously. So we want to make sure that, you know, that, that watchdog groups and, and institutions like public defender's offices, et cetera, who, who have the ability to hold prosecutors accountable are given the resources, given the technical advice and the technical assistance that they are going to need to serve as watchdog groups to make sure that prosecutors aren't coming into court, giving diversion to the person in the white tank and then when, the per, when five or six people in the black tank did exactly the same thing, they're, not, they're suddenly not getting divergent, right? We want there to be a process for oversight, technical assistance to the offices and to the institutions that are working closely with prosecutors um, and can watch them, quite frankly, and make sure that they're not applying, uh, applying um, these systems unfairly. What about the oversight Let's allow let's allow members Tamaki and Holder to finish their presentation. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, and there's you know, there are we we I, I'm just giving you the highlights. This is, a, we have a very expansive uh, list of recommendations um, to make sure that there's more accountability, uniformity, and transparency. Um, a couple of highlights that we didn't put into the, in, into the slides um, are, we want to assure that these systems, these tracking systems that we are now instituting within the prosecutor's office are also being linked to what's happening in terms of bias in policing. We wanna be able to see the cascading bias that starts from the minute a person is stopped because of their race and usually ends with a person getting a much longer sentence because of their race. And so if when we create a track tracking system for the prosecutor's office, we want to make sure that it's linked to the tracking system that has been created by RIPA and other policies to the police, to the police stations, and and, and to the and, and to the um, to the police precincts. So we have a full landscape, a panorama of the of how racism is infecting the system and affecting Black folks. Um, we also want to make sure. Currently, the RJA does not 
allow folks on parole to use that process. But there is a lot of bias in terms of people getting uh, parole violations and getting thrown back into prison based on, on, on a so-called parole violation that might have everything to do with the fact that they're black. And so we wanna make sure that the RJA process is available to people on parole, uh, not just uh, uh, defendants or uh, people defending against their case. Um, and, and, and one of the other important highlights is that we wanna make sure that prosecutors now have an affirmative obligation to turn over any evidence of racial profiling at any stage of the process. And that's really important because right now, defendants have to dig for that information. The prosecutors don't have to, if the prosecutor knows that there was bias at some point, like there was a racist police officer or there was a racist prosecutor on the case, they don't have to turn that over. They don't have an affirmative obligation to turn that over. Right. We want to infuse in this process an affirmative obligation so defendants um, and parolees don't always have to go digging for this information, which is sometimes so difficult to find. Um, and so with that affirmative obligation, the minute you go into an arraignment, you know, to, to plead guilty, for instance, the prosecutor will have to turn over any evidence they have of bias or racism in the system. So those are just some of the highlights um, uh, of, for the recommendations that we've put forth. Happy to entertain questions or turn it back over to Don to finalize. I don't have anything to add. That's great. Thank you so much. Let's go. <laughs> That's an excellent presentation. Any questions or comments from the task force members about what's been presented? Oh, sorry. Member Jones, are you recognized? And I, I definitely want to thank um, the work that um, Member Holder and Tamaki have done. Um, I don't think people really realize um, how important it is that we have this discussion about racial bias in the criminal justice system. It is so, it was so bad and so prevalent that we overfilled the prisons to where a court order had to be issued to reduce the number of people in prison. The fact that we were overrepresented in the CDCR, in the prison system, um, in itself is criminal. And even now, um, I did a bill, AB 2799, Artistic Expression, Act, which protects rap artists, that when they do a, the artistic expression of doing a, a rap album, that would be used in criminal cases against them, even though it had nothing to do with the actual crime. And it's going on right now, as we speak, that DAs are using um, their artistic rap lyrics for, for, for those purposes. And now in California, uh, because of my bill, um, it can't be used that way um, anymore. Um, in floor, and I say rap because they use it predominantly against African American males. Um, they did not go against Johnny Cash when he talked about, or Elvis Presley, or any of those. And so, um, we need to be ever vigilant that in the criminal justice system, even now, um, there's a lot of discussion uh, about opioids and fentanyl, and uh, we're having discussions about which, what should we do? Should we have enhanced penalties? Um, should we go back to that day, not so long ago, when we were scared to death of the crack cocaine epidemic? and we started to do this war on drugs. What ended up to be a war on African-Americans, uh, which separated families, men from their families, which set, broke up communities. And we really need to look at public health alternatives and not just 
public safety alternatives. Because when we go to public safety alternatives, as you heard here, DAs and law enforcement have a tendency to go after us. Justice should be justice, not just us. And what happens is it becomes real easy for law enforcement and criminal justice system to go against or come after just us. And so uh, I've made it a point as chair of public safety for the state of California to look at all of this, everything, and try to come up with alternative ways so that we can help our communities, all communities, no matter what color, so that we ultimately, and I'll give the example if we're talking about drug abuse, let's get to the health causes of it. Let's stop it. Um, let's not move it down the road. Um, we may not have had, we may not no longer worry about crack cocaine, but now we're worried about fentanyl and opiates. Well, quite frankly, I don't know any black pharmaceutical companies that's spreading opioids all over the place. And I don't know of any, anyone south of the border that look like us that are doing it. But I guarantee you, if we don't do this right, they will again fill the prisons with people that look like a lot of people that look like us in this room and outside this room. So it's extremely important that we get it right. Extremely important. And what you just heard about the Racial Justice Act, what you just heard about how we can make sure that we don't have a reoccurrence what had happened during the crack cocaine in the, uh, time is what our esteemed colleagues are talking about, making sure that the criminal justice system doesn't turn on us. And so I, I, I commend them for, for bringing that forward. Um, I really do like some of the ideas that you brought forward and um, maybe be some bills I could think of that I could possibly do in the future. So I wanna, wanna thank you for, for, for the work that you're doing. Member recognize. Uh, thank you, members Tamaki and Holder. This was an excellent um, presentation. And I just wanna say that what you are identifying, particularly in the holding cells, aligns with what I see when I go in and do inspections of the jail, county jail and county jails and the um, lockups at the county courts. Um, I wanted to know if it's, if it's not explicitly stated, if there could be an explicit uplifting of the application of the Racial Justice Act to the county jails. We have seen an incredible level of discrimination and disparity there, including um, retaliation against black folks who by the justice, by the deputies and the um, uh, jail staff, um, limited access to education-based incarceration, uh, limited access to trustee positions where you can get time off for uh, working while you're incarcerated, uh, inadequate um, responses to grievances made by black um, folks who are incarcerated, higher rates of placement into high observation housing, which means you're in the most restricted areas possible in the jail, and in also um, in placement in isolation, and then higher rates of death while in custody if you're African-American. And we have data that we've been compiling for the last few years, but it's been a losing battle with the Sheriff's Department uh, in LA County to try to get these things addressed. I would just say, <clears throat> I think that's a really excellent suggestion. And uh, Dr. Uh, Dif Tiffany Chance and Dr. Randy Ch Chance and Dr. Tiffany Jans uh, has been terrific in um, helping us craft the recommendations and also uh, analyzing the data that we did collect, but none of it ha has to do with in custody treatment, which is what you're saying, that even in custody, there's a dis disparateness in the way uh, that and race plays a part. And so <clears throat> what we'll do is, uh, Member Holder and I will work with the Department of Justice Research Center to see what we can do in that connection, see if it can make its way into the final report in some you know, fashion. Member Bradford, you're recognized. 
Thank you. And I, too, uh, want to echo uh, my appreciation for the report as the former chair of the Senate Public Safety. Many of the issues that you mentioned are still prevalent today and requires additional legislation, as Assemblyman Holden, I mean, um, as Richard Jones Sawyer stated, because um, the practices are still going on today. Just yesterday in public safety, I introduced a piece of legislation that deals with pretextual stops. The number of African Americans and Latinos who are stopped simply because, uh, you know, a headlight's not working, and we know how that has exacerbated to the harm and injury and even the death of individuals such as Orlando Castillo and, you know, Sandra Bland and, um, you know, on and on and on, Dante Wright. So, um, so it's needed, and I'm glad you referenced RIPA because that was the report that we used to, to formulate the legislation and justify it. So um, really appreciate that. And you also mentioned as a former um, defense attorney uh, of having evidence provided many times law enforcement and the prosecutors withhold evidence. That's why also yesterday we introduced SB 441 that requires within three days that of trial that you disclose that evidence that led to that arrest, led to that charge, led to that possible conviction. So you can adequately represent these individuals because many times law enforcement and the prosecuting attorneys hold that back. So this is still critically important and it's still being, you know, happening today. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Bradford. Any other comments or questions? Um, Member Montgomery Step, you're recognized. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to add my appreciation to Members Holder and Tamaki for this report and all that went into it. I, just a, an additional angle as we talk about the disparity that exists in our criminal legal system. Um, as we're embarking on an era where um, folks are considering the care court and uh, the um, conservatorship for people who are experiencing um, homelessness over a long period of time. My concern has always been that African-Americans will get the brunt of whatever that system brings us. And so how that, it kind of holistically fits into our health, our conversation with regard to mental health, but it, it could be, and I don't know how the system is fully set up yet, but it could also have a way through the criminal legal system. I know in San Diego, our city attorney has a separate program um, and, but it's there, she also has the power to prosecute, right? So I'm just thinking, I want that to be just a part of this conversation as we think about all of the different systems that uh, negatively impact African-American people. Um, I am concerned about that one as well. I understand why it's in conversations, but I'm very, very concerned about it. Thank you. Yeah, and just in response to that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons why when I think about this, I'm not just thinking about uh, folks who are in the jail, defendants, you know, awaiting trial, but I'm also just thinking about everyone who's under state supervision, right? State law enforcement supervision. And so, you know, thinking very expansively and holistically about things like conservatorships and how the biases are going to ensure, again, that it's, that it's an outcome that, that negatively and adversely impacts black people more than anybody else if you get put into a conservative ship. And, and being able to, um, to, to have some kind of pathway to defend against that, you know, that decision, if, if there is bias in that decision-making process. So I think raising conservatorships is really, really important. And, you know, all, all of the other, the systems that, when we're thinking about, you know, state supervision of individuals and the biases that go into that decision making, yeah. Okay. Is there any other questions? Or any potential action? Okay. Any last thoughts from members? To, uh, sorry, Attorney Newman, you recognize. Uh, thank you. Um, yes, we do need action on on everything we're going to be talking about today. Uh, we've agendized to talk about each of the different components of the report, um, and the the way forward um, is to vote to accept the recommendations as presented 
Um, and so in this case, it would be accepting the recommendations as presented in chapter 31 and then the recommendations in uh, chapters um, 18 through 30, which are grounded on the data in chapter 31. We will also talk about those at a later time. But the idea is as we progress through the contents of the report um, would be to accept the recommendations as presented subject to the discussion that's had here and we're taking notes. Um, about issues re relating to the jail and, and member Montgomery step your your comments as well. So we'll augment those and then you, uh, you'll have through uh, April 10th to get us edits on the drafts that you have. Um, April 10th is going to be probably a drop dead for us to then make edits, amend the final report and then publish it in advance of the next meeting at which time you will uh, vote uh, to adopt the report as final. Um, so that's sort of the, the tick tock of moving forward from here. So for today, for every single item that we're talking about with regard to the report, we do need a motion um, to adopt uh, the, or accept the recommendations as presented. Um, and then that will sort of put to bed that component of the report. Sorry, Chair Moore. Sure. My understanding was at the end of the day or whenever it's on the agenda, there would be one motion omnibus that basically would wrap everything, but you're asking us to do a chapter by chapter sort of motion. We can do it that way also. So the alternative would be the end of the whole thing, we do it. But again, we'll need to make sure that that definitely happens. Um, and maybe we can break it up so we're very clear um, at the end of today, we have today's stuff and at the end of tomorrow, we have tomorrow's stuff. That can still be done. I think going item by item, you know, we'll clarify each of the components, but if you'd rather do it at the end and say, when we approve the formatting, for example, there's a couple of changes in formatting, we can just have that vote be basically to adopt all the recommendations um, as as made subject to all of the discussion throughout the, the, the two days, we can hold the votes and just do one vote at the end, if that's the preference. It's, it's fine either way. I, subject to the chair's comments, I think that would be easier just to do one vote as opposed to a separate vote for every chapter, but defer that to- uh, I think we should go item by item just so there's okay. no confusion all right yeah. and anybody strongly disagrees with or wants out or wants revisited doing one motion at the end leaves the doj to have to sort of suss out the various conversations so okay. our parliamentarian here uh makes her recommendation thank you in that case may i make a motion all right <clears throat> okay. so i move uh that the recommendations of the um subpoena survey advisory committee be adopted and and be included in the final report. It's been properly moved by member Tamaki and properly seconded by Senator Bradford that the task force approve the recommendations uh, from the subpoena advisory committee and that the recommendations are included uh, in the final report as presented. Is there any discussion on the matter? I had a quick question. Um, did you all collaborate with the RIPA board? Um, and is the Racial Justice Act under their purview as well? I was just curious, so, a technical question. Uh, I don't know if you all is referring to DOJ or to the advisory committee. So the, the RIPA board is another uh, board that it's a, a client of the civil rights enforcement section. Um, and so we you know, are very well aware of the activities that are going on. Um, Aisha also uh, works on, on that board. Um, so we're aware of what they're doing. The Racial Justice Act and the, and the RIPA Act don't necessarily integrally overlap with each other. This is a completely different set of data. And so the recommendation uh, that has been uh, crafted on the advice of the advisory committee for this particular component would be a new set of data collection that wouldn't necessarily be implemented now, depending on how the implementation occurs with regard to differentiation of individual data. You know, there could be sort of a reverse impact on how the RIPA data might be amended. But no, there's not a direct overlap or correlation. Thank you. Any other discussion on the matter? Hearing none, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you. 
I will begin the vote with Madam Chair. Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Um, Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Uh, Member Joan Sawyer? Aye. Member Joan Sawyer votes aye. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Um, Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. And Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there were eight members present in voting. There were eight ayes and zero nays, and there were no abstentions. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. There are eight ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions, and thus the ayes have it, and the motion carries. Uh, the next item on the agenda is lunch, which will um, last from 12.30 to 1.45. It's 12.17, so we'll be breaking early for lunch. Thank you all, and please be back at 1.45. <laughs> yeah, I'm going back to this. So,
All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for your patience. Uh, we will resume. Before we resume, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson to reestablish a quorum. Yes, good afternoon and thank you. I will begin calling the roll with uh, Chair Moore. Present. Chair Moore is present. Uh, Member Bradford. <sighs> Member Bradford is absent. Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder. Yes. Present. Member Holder is present. Mm -hmm. Member Jones Sawyer. Oh, Member Jones Sawyer is absent. Member Lewis, present. Member L Lewis is present. Member Montgomery Step, here. Member Montgomery Step is present. Member Tamaki, here. Member Tamaki is present. <clears throat> Madam Chair, there are nine task force members. And the member needed for quorum is five. There are six members present. A quorum has been established. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been established, we will turn to the next item on the agenda, which is item number seven, discussion and potential action, task force approval of draft report part five. Economic expert analysis and final recommendations of task force regarding calculations of reparations and forms of compensation and restitution, um, including answers to experts' five key questions um, and economic expert analyses presented by um, the expert team, of which Dr. Thomas Kramer is here with us today, um, and myself and member Lewis. Uh, so without further ado, we'll turn to Dr. Thomas Kramer, who will give a comprehensive overview of, you know, what's been discussed um, from the March 3rd and 4th hearing to present, uh, and then we'll have a conversation and then action around um, the conversation. So Dr. Kramer, you are recognized. Thank you very much. Oh, Hello, can you, oh yeah. Um, can I ask whether my fellow experts are um, in, in the room uh, electronically or? Yes, okay, good. Hi, Dr. Spitz. Okay, um, then I'll, um, I'll start going through the presentation and um, I'll ask my fellow experts to um, to correct me where I'm wrong or to uh, chime in with any additional information. Um, the, uh, basically, our chapter outline um, is based on five harms that we focused on. If you could go to the next slide. Um, uh, th these were selected from a long list of harms and atrocities that the state of California is at least partially responsible for. Um, the ex expert team has selected five of those harms from a longer list. Um, and it's not that we, that we say that these are the most important or that the others are unimportant. That is not the point at all. All, all harms should be addressed in the reparations um, uh, proposal. Uh, but these are harms for which we thought we would have data. That's one uh, criterion. And the other is that it's closely related to the actions of the state of California to make our estimates more defensible in the face of challenges that will uh, undoubtedly um, happen once the, the proposal is made public. I should also say that in my presentation, I will not go into the uh, numbers specifically because they are subject to change still as we're getting new um, data in. Um, and this might continue even after the report has been published. Um, I will um, instead show the, the process that we went through and, and answer any questions about that. Um, three of the harms that we selected, health harms, disproportionate black uh, mass incarceration and over-policing, as well as housing discrimination, we have preliminary estimates. 
Um, and for two of the harms, we don't yet because of lack of data. That's unjust property takings by eminent domain and devaluation of black businesses. But I will still address how we would uh, estimate those uh, losses um, if we had the data available. Um, so I'll start with the first atrocity, health harms. Um, basically, what we do is we estimate the annual loss to black non-Hispanic Californians from health disparities by computing the value of the 7.6 uh, li um, year life expectancy gap, that is a big gap, based on the so-called value of statistical life in the United States. That is what statisticians uh, use to, to evaluate how much each individual places value on their lives. Um, we then divide the value associated with the gap by the average black non-Hispanic Californian life expectancy of 71 years to obtain an annual estimate of the loss to black non-Hispanic Californians from health disparities. Now, I should say one thing right up front when I say uh, black non-Hispanic Californians, I don't mean to exclude uh, uh, Hispan uh, black Hispanics who trace their ancestry back to um, slavery in the United States. Um, it's just we don't have a census count of um, of descendants of black descendants of the enslaved yet. So what we are doing is using the the definition of black non-Hispanic Californians as a short hand or a, a, a guesstimate of what the population, of what the size of the population um, with ancestors that were enslaved in the United States will end up being. But that is still an unknown un until um, we get those counts from, from the Census Bureau or from uh, California State. Um, now the second atrocity, disproportionate black mass incarceration and over-policing. Um, we use the fact uh, noted by um, uh, Alexander um, that surveys, representative surveys of, um, uh, of, of Americans show that people of all races use and sell illegal drugs at remarkably similar rates. So any disproportion in the, uh, in the prosecution of African Americans will be a measure of over-policing. Um, uh, over um, so we estimate how many black non-Hispanic Californians, and here the same caveat, this is uh, our stand-in for uh, uh, black uh, descendants of the enslaved in the United States, were arrested for drug felonies above their population percentage during the war on drugs, roughly in the time period from 1970 to 2020. We multiply this number with the average prison term for drug offenses, and with the average annual California state employee's wage, uh, plus a, a term for loss of freedom to arrive at the outstanding total. And then this outstanding total is divided by the black non-Hispanic California population in the year 2020 to come up again with a rough estimate of what might be due. Um, and then I moved to atrocity number three, housing discrimination. Here we determine the average per capita black-white, again, non-Hispanic homeownership wealth gap um, for 1930, for 1980, and then for 2019. Um, the 2019 amount gives us the wealth disparity from all forms of housing discrimination. And we were asked at the last meeting, we were asked to include this estimate so that we don't limit it to, um, to housing discrimination only before 1977, before the Communities Reinvestment Act. Um, the uh, 1980 amount minus the 1930 amount provides us with an estimate of the effect of redlining only. And redlining was a federal policy, but it gave discretion to the state of California to do otherwise. And the state of California chose not to do otherwise, and therefore, in our view, is directly responsible for the effects of redlining. Now, as we did the calculations, ironically, the more specific amount for redlining only is larger due to compounding from 1980 to the present based on 30-year mortgage interest rates. And that is just the fact that compounding exponentially uh, blows up the estimates. Um, so the, 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 uh, the amount we estimated for all forms of discrimination are ironically 
less than the uh, the amount for redlining only. But we provide both of them in the task force can make a determination uh, which amount to go by. And I should mention, this is very important, I should mention that what we are estimating is not reparations. What we are estimating is losses to the um, African-American descendants of the enslaved in the United States uh, based on the data. Um, uh, the, our calculations can be used to come up with determinations of reparations, but it, it's not necessarily identical. The task force can go above and beyond because some losses are frankly very difficult to estimate. I'm thinking, for example, pain and suffering. Um, so that should be definitely also taken into consideration. So we are talking about losses here rather than reparations. Um, now, uh, atrocity number four is, and here we don't have estimates, is um, unjust property takings. And here we would like to obtain roles of blacks who California cities forced to leave with eminent domain to make room for infrastructure projects. And what we would do is we would examine the market value at the time of, uh, of uh, the property taking minus the amount paid to the owner and add in a fair measure of the estimated appreciation to the present day. Alternatively, we would use the current value of the property as a measure of compensation too, but this is problematic as in some cases, like if a highway was built right next to the property, the value may have decreased or the property may be part of an infrastructure process and then it's difficult to determine what a piece of highway is worth. So um, there are definitely these uncertainties, but that might be strategies to come up with estimates for unjust property takings. Next, um, atrocity number five is devaluation of black businesses. And here I hope that Dr. Spriggs can uh, chime in and correct me where I'm misrepresenting the, the approach. Um, I'll just read what I have here. We plan on using the U.S. Census Bureau survey of business owners of 2012. Um, that is where data is available by race of business owner. The goal will be to estimate the wealth portfolio of black people in California that differs from whites in California. And the harm will be estimated using an equation with each state as a separate observation based on the general demand environment of state and local government contracting and household income. Then estimates will be made of the businesses formed and sales receipts generated on those factors. Many sociologists use this approach. Um, so, sorry for the typo here. Um, so, um, that is a way to, to basically, if I understand the approach correctly, to get at what African Americans were able to achieve in terms of businesses and what they would have achieved had there not been um, devaluation of black businesses. Um, and then we have a further list of other harms and atrocities that were part of the original list that we started with. There's very important labor discrimination, segregated education, non-representative state commissions, environmental harm, transgenerational effects, adverse emotional and physical health consequences, and then other potential harms. Um, we don't want to discount those. Those are all individually very important. They are sometimes conceptually more difficult to estimate. Um, but as more sophisticated estimation methods come about, they should be addressed as well so that an, an initial reparations payment could be considered a down payment, a start of a conversation rather than an end of a conversation. And then as new information is coming in, there could be additional payments. Um, and with that, I say thank you very much. And then I ask my fellow experts um, if, if there is anything else that I may have uh, forgotten or misrepresented. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. I have a quick question um, that either Dr. Kramer or the economist can speak to. Um, so as you all probably know, you all have made the news <laughs> today.
today, this morning, uh, with several different headlines. And you spoke to it um, earlier, but if, if folks, if you want to um, articulate it a bit more, I mean, the, the headlines state, it could cost California more than $800 billion to compensate Black residents for generations of over-policing, disproportionate incarceration, and housing discrimination. Economists have towed a state panel considering reparations. So I wanted to make clear that the task force, we've yet to determine any final amounts, as you stated. Um, but if you all want to speak to, for instance, the headlines um, today. Um, yeah, that's difficult for me because I didn't, uh, I haven't had a chance to read the article yet. Um, but I would say this is all premature. And as I mentioned just um, a few moments ago, what we are estimating are losses to African Americans um, who are, have uh, who are descendants of people enslaved in the United States. Uh, we are not um, we are not necessarily suggesting that those losses are equal to the represent uh, to reparations. That is the task of the of the task force to determine. It um, it. I, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that and see if Dr. Spriggs wants to um, add to that. Uh, I would just concur. We, we don't want numbers floating about as we continue our deliberations because uh, we're doing exactly that. And I think it's improper to prejudge what the precise number we may recommend may be, but we're only giving you our expert advice on these specific harms. The task force has full latitude to ignore it, to add to it, or to take into consideration what, um, what Professor Kramer was explaining, because there are other dimensions for which the panel of experts that make up the task force um, are probably more capable at addressing the intangible harms and other considerations that the task force may want to consider. Um. Any other comments or questions uh, related to uh, the presentation uh, made by the economists today before we continue? Okay, another, I guess, lingering point that the task force has to take action on related to this particular item on the agenda is determine, determining residency requirements. Um, I think that the experts did a, a wonderful job in assisting the committee and the task force with working out what that could look like. And so on page six of the draft report, which is also in the presentation they um, gave to us, um, the economists have recommended that the task force recommend that reparations for community harms be provided as standard payments based on an eligible recipient's duration of residence in California during the defined harm period. For example, residents in an over-policed community during the war on drugs from 1971 uh, to 2020. Um, and I think that perfectly, I think, encapsulates kind of the, the debate that we were having over the past two, three months or so. Um, and so I think that in terms of action uh, for the California DOJ's um, purposes that the task force endorse that particular recommendation in terms of uh, the residency requirement that it just be, we recommend that reparations for community harms be provided as standard payments based on an eligible recipient's duration of residence in California during the defined period of harm. So the implications could be um, you, as someone in the public comment stated, could be pushed out, priced out of California, not currently living in the state. But if you can show residency for the period of harm for those various different state sanctioned atrocities we outlined, then you would be eligible for compensation. Um, that is essentially the main implication 
of that recommendation if adopted. Could I add just- Dr. Kramer, you're recognized. Um, thank you. Um, it, it, we were thinking that um, that should be the main task of the, the task force to uh, to make those community-based um, uh, uh, el eligibility, but to also open up the possibility that somebody who can prove direct harm, for example, they had their house taken away by eminent domain, um, that they should get uh, the opportunity to uh, file for uh, for compensation um, as a, a separate process, but uh, that that this should be possible as well. I don't know if that makes sense. Yes, definitely. So that's also another recommendation that I think that we should adopt as a task force. Uh, the third recommendation from the from the economists um, was around there should be no time limit on when an harmed individual uh, or their heirs can submit claim for compensation. So, um, you know, I'm recommending that we adopt the three recommendations from the experts. One being for uh, community-based harms, that residency um, is based on standard payments based on an eligible recipient's duration of residence in California during the defined period of harm. When we're talking about individual payments, we should um, endorse the recommendation um, that the legislature enact an individual claims process to compensate individuals that can prove specific harm for example, an individual who was arrested or incarcerated for a drug charge during the war on drugs, especially if the drug is now considered legal, such as cannabis. And then the third recommendation from the experts, which is uh, that the task force should recommend that there be no time limit when an harmed individual or their heirs submit claims for compensation. Montgomery Sepp, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I just have a, a couple of questions or clarifying, clarifying questions. So with regard to the time limit, it would be that even if an heir um, um, submitted a claim for compensation of harm during the time periods that we have identified, right, then they could do that. So, okay. Um, so, okay, that answers my question. Thank you. And then for the the example given for residents of an over-policed community during the war on drugs from 1971 to 2020. I am um, thinking about those who may not have lived in specific areas that were over-policed, but they were over-policed because they were black in an area, period. And so how does that, does that kind of lock those folks out of this, this um, methodology we're uh, recommending here? Um, sh uh, should I give the experts um, idea about this? Um, certainly, I, I would not say it should, uh, it should disqualify these individuals. This was just an, one example um, of uh, how uh, how uh, these harmed uh, harmed communities could be defined, but I understand that that's a problem to draw community lines uh, around neighborhoods and say anybody outside was not affected. I think there should be a broader definition, but I'm not able to come up with one on the fly. So <laughs> no, no, I, I this has been such a daunting task for you all. Um, so I, I do want to say I appreciate it, and I understand setting this standard, definitely. I just also know that over-policing occurs to Black people, <laughs> no matter where we are, right. and that that would be the only, um, the only thing I think we should keep in mind in yeah, setting the standard. I agree. Just to follow up on that point specifically, there are many studies, you know, by folks like, I mean, Javon didn't, but people in his field who do the geography work that show that actually over policing of African Americans is more likely to happen in gentrifying neighborhoods, right? 
Um, so it's not necessarily that you're looking at a formerly redlined community right. or majority black community. You're actually looking at that, that, that gentrification moment when policing becomes very heavy to, to actually, um, you know, expedite the gentrification process. Yes. So it's, it's a really interesting uh, analysis. And I, I, I guess my question for you is, you know, I feel like you guys have, you all have given us these important descriptive categories um, where, you're, where you're refining your numbers analysis, but there's also like broader prescriptive categories that I guess we as a task force have to be thinking about um, that don't necessarily, you can't necessarily tie them to specific numbers, but they are, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a prescriptive analysis. We we're just thinking more about harms generally, like, um, and how to compensate those. Right. I, I would totally agree with that. I think what we're doing is kind of coming up with a minimum, you know, the, the, the losses, the minimal losses that we can basically uh, determine that happened through the state of California. Uh, but of course, there is other harms that California was involved in, but other actors as well, and it becomes more messy to, to disentangle in, uh, in, a, in a clear analysis. But they should definitely be considered. All forms of discrimination should be considered in, in reparations. So the task force should feel f free to go beyond our loss estimates and uh, determine what the right amount would be. As I mentioned before, the example of, loss, uh, of um, pain and suffering comes in where that is a subjective perception on the part of the victimized group um, that we as, uh, as experts can't necessarily easily uh, determine, um, but it's definitely something the task force uh, could address. Thank you. I think uh, to make matters easier, we can t continue the, the conversation. But I think any potential action should be to entertain a motion to approve uh, draft report part five um, as presented. Um, that would include just what we just discussed. I just wanted to highlight uh, for the audience and also for task force members some of the major tenets um, in draft report part five, as it relates to eligibility, those are questions that were, um, as of to date, have yet to been resolved until we take final um, action via a vote. Um, so again, I think that we should entertain a motion to approve draft report five as presented with an understanding that that would resolve uh, the residency requirements that we've been discussing over the past months. So in terms of community-based harms, it would be based on a standard payment uh, for eligible recipients, um, proving duration of residence in California during the harm period. Um, so it would be, it, current residency would be irrespective. Um, in terms of direct harm, uh, there will also be a bucket for folks to prove individual direct harm for individual payments. Uh, the third tenet is that there would be no time limit uh, for folks to file claims, either individuals or heirs. And then I guess a fourth point um, also in this draft report, the economists have recommended that the elderly are prioritized. So I wanted to, um, Dr. Kramer or any of the other experts can speak to that point. Maybe we can discuss that as, as well before any further action. Yeah, thank you very much for bringing that up. That, that is an important point. The idea behind that recommendation is um, there is a there could be a tendency to say, well, we need to study, study, study more and more and more until we have everything um, figured out before we pay reparations. And that, in my view, would be uh, prolonging the injustice because some people, especially the, the elderly of today, uh, would not stand a chance of getting their share of reparations. Um, and it, it, it would leave them uh, living in, in, in their depressed conditions longer. And that would be, yeah, uh, justice delayed is justice denied is basically the idea. So yes, I would say the, the elderly should be prior, prioritized in a rollout. I, I would just want to reiterate the point made that 
this should not be we have to have finished every harm the research of every harm that resolution on some of these may come much sooner and we would hope that payments could be made on the basis of the harms considered as as dr kramer said uh, down payment on what would be the total uh, we we do not want this to be as we have found california doesn't collect the data yeah. and so it gets off free because it's going to take us a while to collect the data that is available and that should not be a cause for delay and we don't want people to be harmed because of the confounding of uh, that kind of complication. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I guess that's part of what we need to resolve. So uh, the other part that we need to resolve, which is still outstanding, is the actual definition of residency. Um, for instance, would that residency mean, you know, you could show proof that you lived in the state of California for more than half of, of a year of which the harm incurred? Uh, that's still kind of open for discussion. Um, did the economists or public policy experts, did you all have any take on that particular point? I don't think I saw it in the draft section, which is understandable. So then, you know, the task force members will have to have a conversation about how we uh, define residency um, in accordance with, I guess, this draft report once it's presented, if it's, pre uh, if it's approved. Um, I know in past conversations, we talked about, you know, uh, the, the state uh, residency requirements, which as of now is you're a resident of California if uh, you've lived in the state um, for taxpaying purposes for six months. So that's something that we could potentially adhere to as well. Um, Member Scott Lewis, do you have any thoughts? Thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Could I ask a question about, sure. for example, how would homeless be treated with the with the residency requirement? Because I think that's that's a considerable problem in California, and it would be important, especially important, that these individuals be included. I think we preliminary discussed that. I think we still need to have deeper conversations about that. Um, I think one of the records um, of proof, so to speak, that we mentioned earlier was, you know, a letter from a homeless shelter. But even that isn't necessarily um, sufficient. Um, you know, not all homeless folks would be able to have that. Um, so it's still a conversation that needs to be had. Um, yeah. and, and also our children in the child welfare system that are placed outside of the state. I mean, we will have to figure out how to address that so that they're not unintentionally excluded. I think in this proposed agency that we're coming up with, um, there will probably have to be like presumptions of, of, you know, lower barriers for particular folks within the African American community, like the homeless population, like foster and adopted youth, where they won't necessarily be um, held to the same standards as others within the community. Um, I think that would be, you know, the only fair option. Um, 
Member Montgomery, so did you? Uh, no, I just I just wanted to add briefly to the to the conversation about folks who uh, do not have shelter, and also at the rates that they receive um, do not return um, citations or letters from service providers. So that is even another barrier that they receive a higher rate of those do not return kind of statuses or labels than other people do that we're dealing with throughout the state of California right now. So that is another barrier to even prove any type of residency or that you have any kind of dwelling at all um, because of that, that uh, yet another disparity. Dr. Kramer, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, maybe one way would be for these individuals to reverse the burden of proof so that um, if they if they claim that they were homeless in California, that the state has to prove they were not. Hi, right, Chairman. Yes, um, I, I noted that that uh, Attorney Newman came in and 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 spoke to you briefly. Um, did he did he clarify exactly what what terms we need to specifically state around residency? Um, you know, so in the preliminary draft, um, it says that the task force recommends that any reparations program be defined by a residency or, dom uh, or domicile requirement as AB 3121 focuses on the harm inflicted on individuals in California as a result of the actions by California, um, fomented by California laws and policies. So I think what I, what I want to know is specifically, are we being asked to, and, I, and I'm asking this question so that way we can actually decide you know, um, number of months of residency, proof of residency, and what else, if anything else, that we need to decide on. Because I think we might be presently unsure exactly what kind of residency um, model we're meant to establish. So did he provide any further clarification on that? Oh, he just said define residency, residency. like okay. the, the lands. Yeah, you could hear me, Michael, outside? Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Step, step out and that's yeah, I know, then you, you know. That's right the time you got. Um, so again, just like uh, the remainder, of the, just like, you know, the whole report. So the, the task force does not need to make a final decision on these. This is recommendations of the legislature about how the legislature should ultimately craft reparations legislation. So if the task force wants to give some guidance uh, in the recommendations, we would add those into chapter, I forget what chapter this is, part seven, part seven, chapter 17, that's right. Um, we we can translate that into language that would be sort of synthesizing what you're saying right now, which is what what it sounds to me like is a recommendation that somebody be I, I, I don't know if you were saying establish formal residency through a, through being a resident in the state for a certain amount of time, and then any portion a majority of any year thereafter they would have eligibility, or if it's just being present in the state for more than half of the year being eligibility. I think there's a decision that needs to be made there. But again, everything gets translated into a recommendation for the legislature. And so the legislature could end up 
uh, choosing for whatever purpose a different uh, def a different definition of of residency and eligibility. Um, so you don't have to make a decision. You just recommend it, and if it is just you know residency plus presence in the state or presence in the state, uh, that's the recommendation. And then it can be again left to the Freeman's agency to make determinations on eligibility. If people have been here for exactly half a year or have a challenge establishing their residency. And and so within that framework, we could we could we could I'm sorry, did you recognize <laughs> Um, within that framework, we could um, just have like a guidelines and like touchstones. So something like these recommendations or how these laws should be interpreted liberally to be m m as inclusive as possible. Can we can we do stuff that guidelines that are that general? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, 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 I think that's something to consider because similar to the to the way that the economists reference elderly people, we really should be looking at the most vulnerable people um, who are going to have the hardest time, you know, meeting any kind of uh, document documentary proof requirements. Um, and so generally we should be trying to give guidelines and touchstones to the legislature that makes this something that's easy, you know, and, and, and as you recommended, Dr. Kramer, one way to do that is to switch the burden of proof, mm -hmm. right? So it's not on the individual, it's on the state. And so in that way, there's a presumption. There's a presumption of that you meet the, the, the domicile or the residency requirement. Um, especially if you fall into these particularly vulnerable categories. Like okay, great. Um, so it seems like what we need to do is, again, define uh, residency um, and just putting it out there in terms of, you know, making it as easy as possible we can you know, look to what's on the books already in terms of what makes you a California resident, which is nine months. So we can maybe start there or go lower. So there's three things we need to do. One is you know, approve draft report five, which is what the economist just presented. Two, we need to define residency. And part of that second, uh, duty, we could, you know, use again um, the current California uh, rules as a touchstone, starting with nine months and or lessening it. And then the third part of what we need to do is provide a guideline or touchstone around for hyper marginalized people within the descendant community. Uh, we need to, um, you know, provide a caveat, um, a reverse burden of proof. So there's a presumption of eligibility for those particular communities within the descendant community. So in terms of the definition for defining residency, again, um, for tax purposes, you will be presumed to be a California resident for any taxable year in which you spend more than nine months in this state. So I guess taking from that, we could define residency as you are a resident for any year in which you spend more than nine months um, in the state during any given harm period. Uh, so that could be a definition we could use. But again, the conversation would be, is nine months too much? Does it need to be lower? And we can also, you know, entertain a motion just so that, you know, there's some movement and then we can continue the discussion within the motion. Yeah. 
No, I didn't. <laughs> I know. Sure, boy, I, oh, Member Montgomery, sub, you're recognized. I, I have another question. I don't. I don't mean to complicate this more, but based on the uh, residency potential res residency requirement, are is that um, separate and apart from the harms that have been specifically identified, the five harms that have been specifically identified? you would have to prove that and also still live in California for the amount of time, the nine months amount of time. Like, so for example, if I was, if I was arrested um, and did like 10 years in prison for having, possessing marijuana or something like that, and then I got out and moved to Georgia, um, if, if I don't live in California, I would not be, then eligible to submit a claim for that specific harm. I would be. So no matter what, the specific harms, folks are eligible. But it's just the if we go above and beyond or whatever it is, the domicile requirement will be will be in place. I'm just trying to figure that out. So the understanding that I have is that, uh, you know, you're eligible, you know, as long as you can prove that you were resident in the state during the, the years of harm and, and, and further to the recommendations that, you know, the compensation would be actually tied to those years of harm. So, so, then, what, so then how is the, where does the residency requirement come into place? Does that come into play if we take the additional harms that we've identified but can't necessarily quantify and make a decision as a task force that we will uh, do our best to compensate for those things as well, just in generally speaking as a resident of California? You mean beyond the... the what, beyond the, fi beyond beyond the, the five, five that we could... that we could quantify a bit more based on the data that is available to us. I'm just trying to figure out where does the residency requirement fall into this? If, if you can prove a harm during that time period, no right. matter where you live, right. then where, where would the residency requirement be attached? The residency requirement really comes into play, not necessarily for the individual harm compensation bucket, but for the community harm compensation bucket, where we're saying that all descendants of slaves, whether you can prove um, direct harm or not, you should be eligible um, just by virtue of you being a descendant of slave residing in the state of California. During the period. Okay. During the um, period. Okay. And that, okay, I got it. And so that... Never mind. I'm not going to confuse them more, but I got it in my head. Okay. So. <laughs> Thank you for that. So, I mean, my thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I just, can you tell me where did the nine months come from? Um, 2020 publication 1031 guideline for determining resident status. That is from the Franchise Tax Board. Because I was actually looking at that very same document and I didn't, I'm going to look at it again, but I didn't see the nine months in there, but it's a pretty dense little document. Mm -hmm. Page five. You will be presumed to be a California resident for any taxable year in which you spend more than nine months in the state.
but it seems as if you know whether six or nine months that there is interest in in kind of conforming with the standard definition of residency for the state or that the state uses. I, I would agree well, with the state that. State has multiple. Oh, yeah. If you look at one dot, one oh. state entity, it gives gives you one thing. You look at another state entity. Mm. One gives you nine months, one gives you 366 days, right? One day pass for the UCs, you know, it, the DMV gives you yet something else. So there's no uniformity. But there is uniformity within the kind of the, the state tax code, right? So there's, the, so what, what are the, is that what you were referring to earlier, Chair Moore? It's uh, what, what number of months? 2020 publication. Yeah. Just, just, a, just as a precaution, if we are going to be recommending at some point that these funds not be taxable, I don't think we should be using the tax code <laughs> as our statutory standard. We should be looking for a public works code. You know, the you know, either something like the UC requirements or other public programs, whatever their uh, residency requirements are, that's what it should be pegged to. Well, I don't think that's, you know, using the tax, the tax basis for residency is, is implying somehow that, you know, these reparations would be taxed. I mean, I think what I'm trying to get at, and I don't really have a, a hard view on what framework we use. It's just, it's just, you know, trying to find a uniform, a uniform um, framework. And so something like the UC residency, I mean, that's about tuition benefit, you know what I mean? And so the, the motivation behind some of those things has to be, I think, parsed out a little bit um, before, before pursuing that. Um, so but isn't that what we're doing is about benefits. So it seems like yeah, it yeah. aligns better with a benefits mentality than a state tax mentality. Yeah, I think I just want us to like, yeah. you know yeah. what I mean, have a view, like, you know? Did, I guess, Chair Moore, if I could be recognized, I'm sorry. I, I guess I would just like to know um, for the majority of the task force, do we think nine months is too long or too short? And then we can maybe, attach it to some, some some other standard. I do think that it needs to be with another state standard so that it is not an arbitrary decision by us. Um, but um, what else, do we know what other standard, I know we've discussed it a little bit before, but do we know what those others are? And I think maybe just putting them out there at this point so we can kind of have a gauge for the DOJ to go back with and the economists to go back with. Because I, I, I'm okay with attaching it to the nine month framework, understanding that we're using that as a standard and not necessarily as following with the entity and the entity will necessarily be involved in our, in the reparations compensation. You know, as long as we say, we believe that should be tax free. I think that saves us from that, but I'm just more interested in tying it to a state agency or another standard that's out there. Well, if we go with the UC standard, that's 366 days. So that's longer than the FTB standard of nine months. Just putting that out there. Yeah, and that was, that was my point, you know. So the purpose of that long, you know, state requi residency requirement for the UC is so that the UC can actually extract higher tuition from students, you know. So it isn't actually a benefit, a benefit model, you know, following the UC, the UC standard. So, I mean, just okay. point, point of clarification. So the UC is permanent residency for eligibility for the lower rate versus annualized residency for paying taxes. You could pay taxes and then not be a resident of the state the next year and then pay taxes the next year. So I think implicit in this is the determination of, uh, as the experts have discussed, you know, if you're looking at an annualized basis of harm and different years in which harms would be applicable, you go with an annual residency rather than a permanent residency threshold because you wouldn't have an, if you're talking about being present in the state for a certain period of time in order to be eligible for reparations on an annualized basis in that year, obviously 366 days wouldn't work 
Um, so it would need to be something that's definable on an annualized basis if you're going, if the intent is to go with reparations based on uh, establishing residency for the harms that are covered by an annual basis for each of those years that you're a resident. Montgomery Steps question um, about nine months. Um, does does it need to be shorter? Is that a good point, irrespective of where the rule comes from? Should it be longer, but less than obviously twelve months? Um, is the conversation? Currently doing some research right now to to tie the months to any particular agency outside of the FTB, but, you know, I'm going to take a minute. Uh, go ahead, Attorney Newman, you're recognized. And I'm just going to just gonna reiterate, it is well within your authority to make a recommendation based on your sense. I mean, I, I understand that there's a desire to, to tie it into something else, but if, if you feel like it should be, you know, six months plus one day or nine months for 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 that, you know, whatever you want to recommend. And really the point here is to give us guidance so that we can write up something um, in the final report that's going to make clear that you're recommending, um, you know, the reparations be on an annualized basis for presence in the state or residency in the state during that year for all years of, of eligibility or all years of harms. And then we can make that a recommendation to the legislature. And if the legislature feels a need to ground it in some other standard, you know, they would be able to do that through ledge council, as you heard from ledge council on implementation. Uh, you're Thank you. Dr. Kramer, um, could you uh, provide some clarification on the, the housing discrimination period? Um, you know, so there's two options, the 1933 to 1977 or 1850 to present. Um, I know you had, you had briefly um, discussed, you know, the kind of ongoing calculative work that you're doing that might allow for a kind of continuing period through the present. But if you could just reiterate the rationale for that. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. The, um, the 2019 estimate that we produced basically theoretically takes into consideration all forms of uh, housing discrimination because it's, it goes back towards to, to the beginning of the state. Um, and uh, so time before 1933. And uh, it also considers things like uh, gentrification and uh, the subprime mortgage uh, crisis after um, after 1977, but the problem is that um, that it takes a snapshot in 2019 and doesn't compound up for any. I mean, it, you look at the at the inequality in housing that existed in 2019, which is a product of this whole history, um, but it doesn't. Um, allow for it compounding effects uh, to accrue like we had for the redlining period which ended roughly in 1977 not effectively but by law um, and then we could say well from 1980 on at least reparations should have been forthcoming they didn't so what does that cost with compound interest and that adds up to a larger amount so that was the confounding thing even as we did the calculations that was um, that was something to wrap our minds around, which seems counterintuitive. It would be ideal if we could, if we could estimate each form of discrimination in its time period separately. So, for example, discriminatory zoning before 1933, um, redlining from 1933 to 1977. Then, um, if we could find a time period and a clear um, way of measuring uh, gentrification um, 
make, making that as an injustice measurable and then compounding that up to today and then the same with the mortgage crisis. So that would be kind of an ideal way, but I don't see a clear way forward. That doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. It's just um, uh, other experts might um, ha have to come in and, and invent uh, strategies of estimating those in the future. It's just that for us, it was kind of a, uh, an ironic effect that the, the more specific shorter time period led to a larger estimate than the the estimate for the entire period. Um, so, yeah, and I guess the task force will have to come to a determination how to weigh these. So uh, just to clarify, for each of those categories of harm, it, it says to the present. Yeah. So in terms of this discussion about the residency requirement, how should we, op how are we operationalizing the present? Is it the, when the passage of AB 3121 or at the point to which you no longer could collect data like 2020 or 2021 or? That's a great question. And I think um, right now we are not totally consistent between our different no, harms and we'll have to come up with a more consistent um, uh, end point. I think in the last meeting it was discussed the end point should be w uh, when um, the bill uh, 3121 was passed. Uh, that was 2020, right? Mm -hmm. um, so making 2020 the present. Right. Um, and then you can always compound up to whatever is the presence at the time of the payment. Uh, but that would be for the calculation. So, yeah, that w we have to fine tune these things. That's true. right. Because I do remember, didn't we have that conversation before and we use the passage of AB 3121 as yeah. a kind of marker date? Yeah, okay. that's my memory as well. Any other task force members have any thoughts or comments around how we should define residency, residence? I, t I tend to think that for most of these, we don't need to get overly particular. I think we should just make a recommendation that we uh, that it be interpreted consistent with some of the most liberal uh, laws and statutory schemes in the state, right? So if for purposes of public benefits, California has a 180-day rule. That's a statutory scheme that could serve as, that you can peg it to. And so we're just recommending to the legislature that they, that they, they peg it to a statutory scheme with a liberal residency rule. Want to entertain a motion? So, so it, is there a second? Second. It has been properly moved by Senator Bradford and properly seconded by Member Jovan Scott Lewis um, that in terms of residency, um, we define it um, in accordance to some of the more liberal, um, you know, programs in the state. Um, for instance, 180 days for um, public benefits, for instance. Hope that captures the motion. Is there any discussion on the matter? The member holder, was that a good capturing, essentially? Okay, great. Okay, any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for roll call vote. So before there's a vote, just so we unclear the direction to us in drafting it, so we will include something that encapsulate a recommendation to the task force, to the legislature. We'll do some more research between now and and the May second meeting, and you'll see in the next draft, we'll see if we can peg that to any. We can give examples of things that are along those lines as liberal as possible, um, and then that you'll see that in the next draft, if the motion passes, I should say.
Madam Chair, I will start with the voting with you. Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grills votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Jones Sawyer? Absent, I'm sorry. Member Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member Montgomery Step? Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there are seven members present and voting. There were seven ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions. Thank you. There are seven ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions. The ayes have it, and the motion carries. Uh, we're still on action item number seven. Uh, so we need to um, enter uh, entertain a motion to approve draft report part five, um, which includes the touch points that we discussed earlier um, in terms of there will be um, opportunity for folks who are individuals to prove um, direct harm and be eligible for compensation. There will also be uh, opportunities for all descendants of slaves to be eligible for um, compensation via community-based harm via standard payments if they can show residency for any given uh, harm period. There will be no time limit for which uh, individuals or heirs can make claims for compensation. And then the fourth touch point will be uh, the elderly descendants of slaves uh, will be prioritized in terms of cash payments. So once we approve draft report part five, we can move on to the next part of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve draft report part five? I hear you. Yeah, I, I move that we approve draft report five. Is there a second? It has been properly moved by member Grills and properly seconded by member Montgomery Step that the task force approve draft report part five. Econom economic expert analysis and final recommendations of task force regarding calculations of reparations and forms of compensation and restitution. Is there any discussion on the matter? Hearing no further discussion, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Yes, Madam Chair. Aye. Madam Chair votes aye. Brad, um, Member Bradford. Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills. Aye. Member Grill votes aye. Um, Member Holder. Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member Lewis. Aye. Member Lewis votes aye. Member uh, Montgomery Step. Aye. Member Montgomery Step votes aye. Member Tamaki. Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there are seven members present in voting. There are seven ayes and zero nays and no abstentions. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. There are seven ayes, zero nays, and zero abstentions, and thus the ayes have it, and the motion carries. We'll now turn to item number eight, discussion and potential action, communications advisory committee, and communications firm implementation plan updates presented by members Lewis, Bradford, and Charles Group representatives. Good afternoon. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, good. Good afternoon. Uh, sorry I could not be there uh, in person today. Um, I have a small health issue, but I'm here. So just wanted to give you an update on uh, the work we've been doing in the last three weeks and as we move forward um, to June. So next slide, please. 
So our activities continued over from the beginning of the month. We are still conducting, um, of course, the outreach for all the Sacramento meetings. We've done some more partnerships to help spread um, the word. I know that I've heard a couple of the um, audience members ask for weekend meetings. Um, and so there's not much we can do about what day is voted on, but please know that we are making an intentional outreach effort to make sure that not only the media, but the public does know that these, uh, these meetings are happening. We're continuing to, of course, conduct our media coaching and messaging and talking points. We've had some really good um, media hits uh, this month. We have some national ones that are in the play that are in play. Uh, Dr. Grills actually did the Today Show. Uh, Chair Moore is up for one that hasn't aired yet, so I don't wanna spoil it for her quite yet. And we have a couple of others that we are working with. Um, we be, we uh, continue to book and coordinate these interviews. Um, that, that takes time. And I just want people to understand that the back and forth and the scheduling, um, but that is the work that we do. We are also creating and getting ready to launch a social media ad campaign we have also heard from um, you know, the public that that is something they would like to see. So we took that information back and we're trying to see how we can actually make that happen. And as well as we're getting ready to develop and start creating our post communication strategy so that this work doesn't just stop and that people become scattered once the task force does sunset, but they do have a place to go to continue to find information and updates about what's going on about with AB 3121. Uh, next slide, please. So for this meeting, as well as we did a virtual event, we've continued to uh, run the radio ads. Uh, we think that that is important to make sure that we are approaching the communication, not just uh, one way then you know, by sending it out, but also through the radio ads and through the social media campaign and also working and collaborating with uh, organizations that are helping us spread the word. Next slide, please. All right, our activities continue to actually this month, very recently, we collaborated with the ACLU, Bar High, and the Brotherhood of Elders Network, and we delivered a virtual uh, panel event. We actually got very, very good feedback on that. We had 111 people register uh, for that event, and I just wanted to share some of the feedback that came out of that event. So I won't read all of it. You can see it uh, on the slide, but know that we're getting a lot of thank yous for these virtual panels. So we wanna to continue to collaborate with organizations to help put on these uh, virtual events. I think it's just, we can, um, we can reach a broader audience doing this, although we also will continue to do things in person like the one that we did with Dr. Brown. Next slide, please. So we will continue to make sure we manage any um, media opportunities that are coming our way, as well as reaching out and pitching out media opportunities. Uh, we will continue to uh, provide the social media assets. We have had organizations ask us to join our mailing list. And so uh, we are adding them to our mailing list. We're seeing it get reposted. We know that the Secretary of State is reposting it. Um, the ACLU is reposting it. So there are organizations out there that are, uh, CJEC is reposting it. Thank you guys so much for that. Um, and they're just sharing the information to let people know um, about the meetings and keep them updated about what is going on. We're also looking for and identifying opportunities to collaborate with community organizations, again, to put on you know, events or panels that we can help um, in these last few days to really help spread the word, and as well as to combat the miscommunication. Again, I heard uh, a public comment today about the miscommunication, that is right. But unfortunately, it's hard sometimes to ring in all of the media, but as much as we can do and as fast as we can do it and as uh, fast as we can do it, that is what we are trying to do to make sure that people have the opportunity to ask questions and to know what, uh, what is going on. One of our main things that we're also doing in the next 90 days is to make sure that we're developing a uh, just post communications activities, including the collaborations, um, continuing uh, for endorsements, as well as creating a California uh, state reparations landing page, which is, should be and serve as kind of a one stop shop for what has happened, as well as to give updates on what will be happening um, and any just post support suggestions. Uh, Chair Moore had sent me information from a, a reporter that was saying, hey, like, what do we do next? And so we want to think through and think about what it is that we do next as the final report comes out. Next slide, please. 
And so in regards to that one stop shop page, uh, this is just a draft of where we're starting to go with it so that you can see it'll talk about the bill, it'll talk about why reparations, it'll give some um, background information, as well as some up to date information um, as we move forward once it's launched and as the task force sunsets. Next slide, please. That is all we have in the last three weeks. So thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions, comments? Yeah. Bradford, you're recognized. Yes, I'm just curious as to the radio outreach, why only one station when there's a swath of stations throughout the state of California? Uh, one is funding and because they are in Sacramento. Can you speak to the funding piece a little bit? Uh, we have to pay for the radio ads. And so we have to find funding for that. And so I don't know where all the funding come from. I just take the information back, say, hey, this is what we're trying to do. Is there any funding? I get, hey, here's an allotted amount. And we can try to do something with that. So it's not that there is no, from what I understand, there's not an approved budget to just do a uh, thing. So we've just been trying to work with UCLA to do some of the things that the public has asked for and that we know one is wanted and two can actually help uh, with the movement and to spread the word. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I, I mean, again, so the radio station that you used here in Sacramento, was that free or did, you, did we pay or did you pay for it? Uh, it was paid, it was paid. So how did you choose, um, I, I guess because we're doing the hearing in Sacramento and that's why you chose that radio station versus maybe a station with a broader reach in LA or something like that or in San Diego? Yes, that is exactly uh, why. And actually last month we actually did use also KBLA as well as KDEE. But what about KGLH? It's one of the bigger black but, the, it too, It's expensive. Um, we can work with that. So. I have relationships there, so I would love to see us try to reach out there. All right, we can take it offline and we can definitely yeah. see what we All can right. do. That would be great, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? I'm just curious, have we reached out to even stations about PSAs versus paid buys, public service announcements, because this is, what this falls in under instead of a commercial or enterprise? Um, we we have, um, but we have we just haven't been able to work it out or work it out as fast as we need it to to be or as fast as we need it to happen. So like we only had three weeks for this, so we ended up having to write the commercial. We ended up having to work with them and to get it done. But now that we know we have a little bit more time, we will um, see what we can do. All right. Any other comments, questions? That's one comment I'll say, um, just putting this out there that we need to start having more education around some of the findings um, from the task force's report. So for instance, we've heard time and time again um, in you know conservative media or just reparations obstructionists, for instance, why does California have a, ta a task force? California was never a slave state, uh, but this task force, we did our due diligence to disrupt that myth very, very early on in our work. So September 2021, we invited you know experts like Professor Stacy Smith, who pretty much disrupted that myth, stating that there were over 1,500 Black people who were enslaved in the state. Not only that, the state of California enacted a fugitive slave law two short years after it was entered into the union as a so-called free state. So I would love to see more, I guess, maybe through a PSA, um, just creative ways from a comms perspective to dispel those myths that kind of, you know, um, obstruct what we're trying to do. So just putting that out there, like, wanted to see again more PSAs, more comms related to California's role um, in the institution of slavery and of course it's lingering badges and incidents. So I, I trust that uh, you'll take that um, and run with it. So thank you. Thank you, Chair Moore. Uh, member Girls, you recognize. 
Um, to, to your point, I, I think that there's a kind of a fine line between communications and public education. And so some of what you're describing actually is being addressed under public education, which we'll get to later. Um, but yeah, I just want us to acknowledge that, you know, there is a fine line and there's only going to be, but so much that communications can do to educate the public and that we also have a task of educating the public and we have prepared some talking points that all of us will have a responsibility for communicating out to correct the narrative. Thank you. Now, I was literally just referencing the contract between the comms group and the Bunch Center, which I had obvious knowledge of as someone who was on the committee at a point in time with yourself. And the contract does provide funding for the communications consultant to educate uh, the community um, about the task force findings. So that's what I'm referencing. But duly noted, there is a role and responsibility for the public education committee to also do that work as well. Any other comments or questions? Thank you, uh, Shauna and Mitchell. We'll now turn to the next item on the agenda, which is the break. We can elect to keep moving forward or take a 15 minute break as we are a bit behind, but we can still take our break. We'll take a 15 minute break.
Uh, all right. So we will resume meeting. Uh, before we resume, we will turn to uh, Parliamentarian Johnson to reestablish a quorum. Thank you. I will begin by calling um, <clears throat> Chair Moore. Uh, present. Chair Moore is present. Member Bradford. Member Bradford is absent. Member Grills. Present. Member Grills is present. Member Holder. Here. Member Holder is present. Member Jones Sawyer is absent. Member Lewis. Present. Member Lewis is present. Uh, Member Montgomery Stepp. Here. Member Montgomery Stepp is present. Member Tamaki. Present. Member Tamaki is present. Madam Chair, there are nine members on the task force. It requires five present to establish a quorum. There are six members present. Madam Chair, a quorum, quorum has been established. And let the record reflect that uh, Member Bradford is present. And uh, we have seven members on the dais, on the task force, present. Thank you, Parliamentarian Johnson. Now that a quorum has been reestablished, we will turn to item number 10 on the agenda, which is discussion and potential action, task force approval of draft report part four, how the state of California will offer a formal apology on behalf of the people of California for the perpetration of gross human rights violations and crimes against humanity on African slaves and their descendants pursuant to government code A301.1 subdivision B3B, or in other words, AB3121, presented by members Tamaki and Grills. Thank you, Chair Moore. Thank you, Chair Moore. Um, with respect to the section on apologies, is the Department of Justice going to do that part of the presentation? Sure, we can. Okay, that, that was my understanding. I hope I didn't catch you unawares. Do you want me to start with that? Yeah. Let me just pull it up. Oh, there's a um, short, short and sweet. Uh, so synthesizing the information that we received in the last meeting, uh, and, or the direction we received in the last meeting, and then bringing together the different parts of the uh, outlines that detailed recommendations of the task force on um, apologies throughout the report, uh, we uh, compiled uh, the chapter that you all received, chapter 16, uh, received and hopefully had a chance to review that encapsulates all of the um, information and discussions on all the apologies, including um, specific apologies that have been uh, made in the past uh, and recommendations of specific items um, for which California has to apologize. Uh, including an acknowledgement per the discussion in the last meeting of individual California leaders um, throughout, uh, throughout California's history um, for which the state should apologize in principle. Um, the uh, to sort of the question for the task force is aside from, you know, confirming uh, that uh, you are good with the draft of the chapter as it is, uh, we, of course, want additional information, feedback, suggestions on that, uh, as well as additional individuals or specific actions in California's past that you should that you think should be included uh, in the chapter. Um, and then the question for the task force is uh, the degree to which we should uh, delineate other apologies um, in the chapter itself. So if you have feedback on that, and then I'll remind you, you know, the, the key here is uh, the April 10th date by which you all should give us feedback on, uh, in addition to the, any conversation you want to have here um, with regard to this chapter section, and then we can incorporate that into the final draft. Uh, but the deadline this. is April 10th. April 10th. Okay, good to know. So just to remind um, task force members, uh, in prior drafts, 
uh, in terms of the recommendations emanating from the 13 chapters of the interim report. The apologies were sort of buried in each section, uh, but we thought it would be more efficient if it was all bundled into one chapter and, and consolidated there for convenience and um, for both educators, policymakers, news media uh, to be directed toward that one chapter. Um, the uh, paragraphs or the sections and the, the wording of those um, apologies are all in the published materials and they're extensive. Um, and I think the Department of Justice did a really terrific job in um, identifying them and, and then formatting them to, into to one chapter. So thank you. Um, I wonder if you could pull up the um, the PowerPoint on the public edu other public education points, if that's possible. And just to uh, reiterate what Chair Moore uh, had said in introducing this, the AB 3121 required as um, the, one of the mandates that the task force is to carry out is to educate the public on the harm. And as we heard in some of the um, folks objecting and criticizing reparations, the lack of information um, on this history um, that is so well documented in the interim report is not widely known. And therefore, certainly part of the task is to educate the public on that, and then also um, to move the needle of public opinion. And uh, the history has been so buried, so erased, so denied, that um, I think that's an essential element of our mission, and it's required by AB 3121. Um, the public education part straddles uh, two time frames. We are doing public education now as, you know, during the lifetime of the task force. And we're making recommendations to the legislature uh, for what should be done after the t task force sunsets. And there are certain projects we're gonna talk about that are being launched now that will continue on um, after the task force sunsets and should be supported with uh, additional funding um after you know we sunset but we are we have a certain amount of resources that we can devote to getting this project started that um we'll be talking about so with that um can we go to the first uh, slide okay so <clears throat> this summarizes basically our charge and then uh, the outreach by uh, task force members to the public and to the bunch center. And every task force member is participating in these uh, media and also um, public education events uh, that are being organized both by outside parties, but also by the uh, Charles Communication uh, Group. Um, so this just sim summarizes uh, some of the things that um, Shauna Charles talked about, there's a uh, crossover between public education and comms, um, and that's necessary, but um, this just sort of discusses that. Next slide, please. So <clears throat> the major project that we're lining up is, the, is to turn this groundbreaking monumental report, uh, the interim report, into curriculum and uh, to develop cur curriculum is at least a year project, if not more, and um, it is probably most suitable in its most standard form for high school, particularly nine grades 9 through 12, uh, but we'd like to be, be able to create um, curriculum in a way that in some ways, form or fashion, um, would impact all grade levels, uh, but in particular high school. And some of these modules that come out of the 13 chapters, whether it's enslavement or racial terror um, or education or housing or labor, um, can be broken out and be usable in college and the university levels 
also um, within the prison system and just for broader public dissemination. So the vision here is that uh, it, we would develop a standard curriculum, but it would be usable for other derivative kind of works. Those could be in the form of online curriculum. It could be in the form of, of um, film documentaries, could be in the form of books, uh, dramatic works, uh, as well as um, uh, history. And, uh, but starting with the interim report and then letting it um, develop into these other forms uh, is, you know, has been the goal. Next slide, please. So before we get to this, this is really um, uh, Member Cheryl, oh, Cheryl Grills is going to be talking about. Um, but I do want to present a little bit about the curriculum development. So uh, through the Bunch Center um, and through our own outreach, and special thanks to uh, Professor Scott Lewis, uh, we identified two um, Berkeley School of Education professors, uh, Travis Bristol and Tolani Britton. Uh, both, as I said in the last meeting, have experience of teaching in the public schools, but also are professors and um, PhDs that are studying um, how, to, how to educate um, students uh, within the school system, but with an emphasis toward, uh, in particular, the black community and uh, the problems um, in terms of how that, our hist that history is taught. And so we've been in conversation with them for the past uh, month and a half, and they have produced an outline of what the next steps would be. And we are taking steps to um, commence uh, the contracting process with them. And they will continue to develop and work on this uh, even after the task force sunsets. Um, it will be the beginning of the project. The funding that is available, I don't think will fund the entire project, but there's sufficient funds, I believe, to get them substantially into this uh, the process. And basically it would cover uh, work done in three areas. One, beginning with community engagement with students and teachers and educators and community leaders just to get feedback about how the history and the information in the interim report uh, should be taught. Secondly, to from that uh, dialogue uh, to produce um, an outline, a model curriculum, again, the substance based on the interim report. And the third part is to um, have test pilots, uh, again, back with teachers, students, uh, districts, to educate that, uh, to, to see how that would run. And then the fourth thing is coordinate it with um, current um, educational requirements, uh, such as the core curriculum requirements in the state of California. Uh, part of that is also assessing what materials are out there in terms of uh, teaching on this subject matter, not only in California, but in other states, with the idea of bringing back the best and most effective methods of, of teaching this material. And so, again, in the interest of educating the public in a more organized and sustainable way, the curriculum we see is, is the way to go. And um, I think it's something that, um, as we deal with, no doubt, very controversial topics about what reparations are, I think curriculum is one of those areas where uh, everybody uh, can, re can agree about how crucial uh, that is. In contrast to what's happening in other, other states where state legislatures and school boards are trying to regulate what teachers can teach, ban books, erase history, I think this is a model really for the rest of the country as to how uh, we begin to shine a light on a topic that no one um, in the rest of the states has wanted to talk about and um, has chosen a path of, you know, ignorance, willful ignorance, or willful amnesia. So <clears throat> I think um, the curriculum project is a terrific first, first step. I would uh, emphasize to Senator uh, Bradford and Assemblyman John Sawyer that 
this curriculum project as it begins to move along will be able to produce what the curriculum will should ultimately look like but it will need more funding to complete it we don't have enough money to complete it but we have sufficient funds to get it started so like the other deliverables that have happened including as i said the interim report the curriculum is going to be another positive uh, delivery uh, by this task force that i think the members um, can be proud of so with that i'll stop and then turn to member grills to talk about um, i guess you call them frequently asked questions and then suggested answers that can be also used to educate the public but also can be the basis for the comms um, activity in developing talking points thank you member tamaki so there are in fact a number of very common questions raised and statements raised about not just the California reparations efforts, but reparations in general for um, people of African ancestry, African Americans, direct descendants, whatever you want to call us. Lack of information um, about these things is one, lack of information is one thing, I'll just put it that way. Willful amnesia or erasure is another. So there are several groups of people who are raising these questions, and I think we need to be clear about who we're gonna be trying to speak to with these um, responses to commonly asked questions. One group of folks are people who genuinely just lack information, and they're open to receiving new information. There's another group of people who've already made up their minds um, and really are not going to be open to receiving information. This is gonna be outright rejected. But there's a third group also, and these are um, people for whom they, they tend to operate from a white supremacy um, position or point of view, and they will denigrate or belittle the mere idea of reparations. And so it's not even a question about whether or not they're even going to be able to receive any information and process that. Who are we really trying to get to and speak to? It will be that first group, people who genuinely are interested, uh, people who don't know the real issues, who don't understand reparations. And because of the deficiency in our education system nationally and in the state around the experiences of racial oppression uh, and racism across multiple generations in this country, they just don't know. Um, so what we are proposing and what we've done is begun a, a draft document that lays out the commonly cited questions and then lists some potential responses grounded in fact uh, and information. The responses are really designed to, report, to support those who generally want to know, and they're also designed to provide a clear rebuttal um, to those who um, are continuing to denigrate and attack the idea of reparations. This information will be useful to the communications firm, but also this information is important for all members of the task force, particularly as we're out there in the public arena trying to respond to questions and comments from the media um, at uh, public meetings and town halls, et cetera. I also think that it will be useful for the general public uh, particularly um, African Americans who believe in reparations but aren't necessarily armed with the information that they need to uh, rebut comments that are anti-reparations. Uh, so that uh, is all we have to say on that particular part. Any questions? I think we're done. Uh, Senator Raffer, you're recognized. No, I just want to commend both Dr. Grills and uh, uh, Mr. Tamaki for this piece. I think it's critical, and I hope we all embrace that. And I know Mr. Tamaki has reached out to my office as regarding the funding aspects of this, and uh, this is something that I will be definitely pushing for because I think it's critically important that we educate not only those folks who uh, are eligible for reparations, but I think the greater public, as Dr. Grills and, uh, and Mr. Tamaki have clearly stated, uh, education is key. 
and sharing um, this curriculum both in the schools and in the public as a whole, I think it's going to uh, allow us to better sell what it is, but also it counters what we see happening in other states all across this country that we can take a very progressive uh, role in not only um, moving forward with ed um, uh, reparations, but also educating the greater public as to the atrocities that happen in this country and the, and the after effects and the remnants of slavery that still exist here in, in this state and in this country. So thank you for this. And I look forward to working with you guys and moving this forward. This reminded me of something else that I think is important to share um, be, because it, it really supports the reason why we need to do this education and the um, correction of the narrative around reparations. There is some empirical research out there that actually has shown that the, le the, the more you are ignorant to the actual issues and facts, the more likely you are to oppose anything that is in support of social justice and reparations. Um, one really interesting article, it, it's actually called The Marley Effect, as in Bob Marley. And it actually tests this idea of what kind of judgments and attitudes will you have if you are armed with actual historical information versus not. And so, and, and the conclusion of the article, one of the conclusions is, it is essential that people have information. If we want, if we want to move the needle, we, people have to be armed with information. I, I did forget um, <clears throat> a couple of items here. So thank you, uh, Chair Moore, for allowing me to continue. Um, so one of the early recommendations that we had um, uh, uh, began to develop was a fund uh, to fund creative works, to fund documentary films, uh, to fund books, literature, again, emanating from the um, interim report. And um, there's some you know, precedent for that with the Japanese American redress and reparations effort. Yep, there was uh, direct monetary compensation, but there also was um, a fund to fund um, important educational works. And that was also duplicated within the state of California with a separate fund uh, run under the auspices of the California Library that continues to, to operate. And I could say that it, ha it has had enormous uh, impact on the public's knowledge. Whereas uh, when this first issue was first raised in the 1980s, um, people had no idea that there were Ameri concentration camps for Americans and that Americans and citizens had, were put there uh, for no reason other than they happened to look like the enemy. Uh, even though they're born in this country and they're loyal to the country and so on. And um, if you contrast the knowledge then and the knowledge now, it's literally day and night. And part of that is attributable to those two funds. So we didn't include that in the materials. Um, I would ask the Department of Justice to indulge me in uh, adding that as something that we should include as part of the recommendations. Um, and we, we will certainly help um, the Department of Justice fill that out and direct them to resources, including the funds that were um, created uh, in the wake of the reparations movement for Japanese Americans. Um, I'd say the second thing uh, that I need to point out is um, outside organizations, specifically the, um, the John M. Langston Bar Association, the Black Bar in Los Angeles, and the Japanese American Bar Association uh, have, with other organizations, been leading the charge on getting endorsements from um, civic organizations, from professional societies, from service organizations. And this is a, a multiracial group of big and small um, organizations from different sectors. Um, including uh, the faith community and, and others. And now that endorsement is up to 131. And I think when we reported on this at the meeting, you know, at the last hearing, uh, it was about 80. So literally it's growing uh, rapidly. And we hope um, that by June, by the time we submit our 
report, um, you know, we'll have several hundred, my hope. So <clears throat> if anybody's interested, it's um, supportreparations.org. One word, supportreparations.org. And there's a listing and uh, a way that um, different organizations can endorse at whatever level they, they feel comfortable in as specified in that website. So again, that's also part of the public education process. Can I also add yeah, I, I just wanna say there's also one thing, if you go to that website, you may not initially glean some, some of the significance of who has signed on. Um, so for example, all four regions of, of California's ACLU, number of bar associations, et cetera. But also I'm um, really happy to say that my colleagues in the sister associations, um, the Ethnic Psychological Associations, the National Latinx Psychological Association, the Asian American Psychological Association, the Association of Black Psychologists, and 20 some odd divisions of the American Psychological Association have all submitted letters. And the last one that's coming in uh, should be hopefully in the next week or two would be the Society of Indian Psychologists. That is a big deal for all of the ethnic psychological associations to sign on to the importance of the findings. And uh, you can read their independent letters uh, if you go to the website. Thank you, that's fantastic. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention last meeting, but the Players Coalition also endorsed the task force uh, and the report. Uh, so I'll make sure that they um, endorse formally. The Players Coalition um, is a 501c3 charity and 501c4 advocacy organization that comprises of over 1,400 professional athletes across several different professional uh, sports leagues. So that's an amazing endorsement as Terrific. well. Terrific. Yeah. Thank you both so much for the work that you all are doing. Uh, this is super, super important. Um, any other questions, comments? Do we need to do a vote? Yes. Before So before moving on, I'll, I'll note these two chapters, um, 17 and 33, I think, are the numbers. 16 and 33. Hold on. Sorry. 16 and 33. Uh, these two chapters are new. So this is the first time you are seeing the two chapters on the apology and on the curriculum development and educating the public recommendations. So because they are because they are new, um, we would like for a vote um, to approve of both and move forward subject to, I think there's some feedback about um, adding in uh, language on um, Education or or artist uh, um, funds, and we'll we'll take that directly from. If you could point us to that, that'd be good. But we'll basically probably copy that over since that seems to have been successful. Um, so it's approval of sixteen and chapter sixteen and thirty three to move forward, um, and subject to the conversation that was had. And then again, reiterating, if anybody has any updates, information, edits. Etc. cetera, um, by April 10th, provide that to us and we'll incorporate that into the final report. <coughs> may I make a motion? So with the caveat that um, further ev edits may be on the way and the deadline is uh, April 10th, that uh, I make a motion to approve uh, the recommendations of chapter 16 and 33. Second. It has been properly moved by Member Tamaki and properly seconded by Member Grills that the task force uh, approved the recommendations in Chapter 16 and Chapter 33 of the draft final report. Uh, is there any uh, discussion on the matter? Hearing none, I'll turn to Parliamentarian Johnson for a roll call vote. Thank you. I will call beginning with uh, Chair Moore. Aye. Chair Moore votes aye. Member Bradford? Aye. Member Bradford votes aye. Member Grills? Aye. Member Grill votes aye. Member Holder? Aye. Member Holder votes aye. Member uh, Lewis? Aye. Member Lewis votes aye.
Member Montgomery Stepp? Aye. Member Montgomery Stepp votes aye. Member Tamaki? Aye. Member Tamaki votes aye. Madam Chair, there are seven members present in voting. Uh, there are seven ayes and zero nays and zero abstentions. Thank you. There are seven ayes, zero nays, zero abstentions. The ayes have it and the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item number 12. Discussion and potential action item, DOJ updates. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the only update that we have is just to, again, reiterate the um, April 10th deadline, uh, which you'll hear us probably say and get tired of hearing us say <laughs> over the next day. Uh, but the April 10th deadline for any feedback and guidance uh, in preparation of the final draft. Um, and um, that's all. Just right away. Thank you. If there are any other updates, the next item on the agenda is item number 13, which is recess. So we will be recessing and reconvening uh, for the second day tomorrow at 9 a.m. Again, public comment will be two hours. Phone lines will be first and person comments will be second. Uh, thank you all for uh, coming and for participating, and see you all tomorrow. <laughs>